Back on the record in State versus Brian Smith, 3 a.m. 199901. Mr. Smith is here. Council are all present, and we've got the complete jury waiting back in the jury room. A couple of things before we call them in. First, uh, where, how are we at schedule wise? Are we ahead of I schedule? We are on schedule, Judge. We anticipate being done with uh, state's evidence by the end of next week. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, second, I, as requested, I just dis distributed the uh, language for my proposed language for the instruction that was under discussion at the close of the day yesterday. Mr. Yes. Ayers already approved that language. The only change I would suggest is at the last sentence you say, unless otherwise noted, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put that in. You already tell them about objections because it doesn't clarify who's noting. So like the defense implied that the police did something illegal. They've noted that. I just would cut that. Unless the court has ruled otherwise. That works. Any objection? No, no, Judge. And for the record, I, I don't think I've applied implied that there's any unconstitutionality. I think that the state is reading into my cross-examination, but I never said explicitly or implicitly that anything illegal happened. I'll tell you, we'll discuss this a little bit so you'll be able to take my thinking into account if you want to in, in the future. Um, the reason I've made the last, suggested the language in the last sentence rather than, than the uh, more direct language proposed by the state is because I, I sense the defense may want to make the argument that uh, the interrogation was in some fashion unfair in that, and you don't have to confirm or deny this, I'm not asking for that, uh, in, in that um, every effort was made to get him to talk as much as possible before he sought legal advice and or any other advice. And um, that's an argument the defense can make uh, to the extent that it unintentionally or otherwise sounds like the, there's an argument being made that his rights were violated that's that would require me to instruct the jury more plainly, but I'm not doing it now because I don't want to have the jury think the judge is putting his thumb on the balance. Um, I'm simply saying in another way, what we've already said in previous instructions, that evidence is admissible until the court says it's not. I agree. Okay. All right. Um, is there anything else before we bring them in? No, Judge. No, thank you. Let's bring the jury in.
Please be seated, everyone. We've got a jury back with us. It's 846. Everyone else is here that needs to be here in order to proceed with the trial in the Brian Smith case. Folks, before we hear from another witness, I have an instruction to read to you. You heard some questions in testimony yesterday about whether Mr. Smith's constitutional rights were violated during his police interview. Whether or not his constitutional rights have been violated is a determination that is made by the court, not the jury. You must not speculate about whether or not Mr. Smith's rights have been violated during your deliberations. Unless the court has ruled otherwise, all evidence presented to you in this case has been ruled to be admissible. I think we're, with that, we're ready to hear from the state's next witness. Judge, the state calls Special Agent Eric Perry. Please come up here next to me, sir. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Got the drill. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in the case now before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please proceed and please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Good morning. My name is uh, Eric. Perry. My first name is E R I C. My last name is P E R R Y. And Special Agent Perry, could you please introduce yourself to the jury? Uh, like I said, I'm uh, Eric. I'm a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Um, I'm a full time member of our cellular analysis survey team. How long have you been a special agent with the FBI? Um, over 15 years now. Um, and as far as education goes, what kind of education have you received before you went to the FBI? I have a bachelor's in science in um, recreational law enforcement. Um, so I had a college, I got hired as a park ranger. So. And how long were you a park ranger? For about three and a half years. And then do you have any experience between doing that and going to the FBI? I do. Um, I, in 1998, I was hired by the Colorado State Patrol and I was a state trooper in uh, Durango, Colorado, as well as an investigator up in Denver, Colorado for about uh, 10 and a half years. And getting back to your employment with the FBI, what are your responsibilities as an agent uh, at the FBI? Um, as an agent or as my current role? Uh, as an agent first, and, oh. then in your, well, and then we'll get into your current role. Um, as a routine, uh, our normal duties as a special agent is, for me in particular, uh, revolves around violent crime, such as bank robberies, fugitives, kidnappings, um, extortions, homicides, um, crime, crimes on Indian reservations, crimes against uh, children. Um, we have a, there's hundreds of federal violations that we can investigate, but uh, we also provide assistance to our state and local agencies throughout the country, as well as foreign governments, uh, such as like in Canada and Japan and, and uh, other countries in Europe. Before we get into your current role at the FBI, what other places have you and offices have you worked um, or where all have you worked as a, an agent at the FBI? Um, I've physically been located. Um, we, we provide assistance to every office within in my current role, but um, I've worked in New York City for nine years. Uh, I've been in uh, Fresno, California, Denver, Colorado, or predominantly, where, but most of my time was in New York, and I've been in Tacoma, Washington for about five years now. And that's currently where you're stationed? Yes. Okay. And what is your current role with the FBI? Uh, currently, I'm a full-time member of our cellular analysis survey team. We, we love our acronyms, so we go by the acronym of CAST, so that's C-A-S-T. Um, my, I have a pretty unique position. I'm a headquarters body, but I sit in the field. So my bosses are all back in DC. Um, don't get to see them too much, which is okay. Um, and we just, uh, and I sit in the Tacoma office and I have a, a cover of the Pacific Northwest to include up here into Alaska. What exactly is um, historical cell site analysis? Anytime that your phone, you use your phone to make a text or to make a phone call, receive a call or send or receive a text or connect to the Internet or go to Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram, um, that information, there's a record that is generated. Those records are called call detail records. 
Those are maintained um, by the cell phone providers and upon a legal request, law enforcement can obtain those records. Um, information in those records will often include who's talking to who, who's texting who, um, with, if your phone's using a data session for how long, when the date and time of that event happened. Um, where we focus on though is the, the location. It will provide us the cell tower that your phone connected to and the direction, which is called the sector. It will tell you what side of the cell tower was used and for how long. So we talked a little, a little bit about you being on the cast team. What exactly does the cast team then do? The cast team, we have, there's approximately, there's over 83 of us now um, throughout the country. And we utilize those records to um, determine the historical location, and in some cases, real-time locations of cellular devices, and as well as other devices, um, we're able to create an analysis. We're able to map out the cell towers that were used, the direction that was used on that cell tower, and we can offer a general uh, an opinion on the general location that a phone had to have been located at the time of that event. And we're able to kind of go back and say that the phone had to be in a particular area at a particular time. And we utilize this process to further investigations, um, as well as we do a lot of search and rescue. Um, so we'll map out the phones, uh, the phone records of individuals that have been lost, and we'll help our search and rescue um, teams go out and find these individuals. And we've done that. I mean, I've done it all throughout Alaska, up in the Denali area, down to Homer, Seward. Um, we've done it up in Kotzebue, you know, all the way out, you know, to Nome. Um, people tend to get lost up here, so we're able to successfully use that to determine the general search areas. Do you receive, um, as part of this CAST team, have you received specialized training regarding cellular, cellular telephones, cellular technology, and historical cell site analysis? Yes. Um, to date, I've, I have approximately over a thousand hours of pilot, uh, specialized training um, for in regards to historical cell site analysis, as well as RF technology and the, the location of devices. Um, a majority of this training is provided to us by all of the major cellular providers, such as AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and up here, GCI. We are trained by the RF engineers of these companies to understand how their cellular networks operate and how they are designed. But then we're also trained by the members of their subpoena compliance group, which will teach us how to interpret the call detail records. So as, as you guys... I've been doing this since 2007, but I've been a team member of CAS since 2011. Well, so from that point, we actually changed to, you know, we advanced into 5G, right? New technology, LTE 5G. So we had to le relearn the records and uh, we, we continue to get updated, continuing education from all the major providers. In two weeks, I'll be in Florida with all of the providers. We are also trained by RF engineers from the Florida Institute of Technology. Um, scientists, they train us on how to um, properly um, interpret the records as well as understand the how the networks operate. Um, how often would you say that you analyze cell phone records? Probably four to five times a day. Um, I've analyzed well over 2000 sets of records in my time with CAS. Um, and have you been, have you, you talked a little bit earlier about helping with search and rescue, but have you also uh, helped um, with other, law, with law enforcement work on cases where you're called upon to determine location of a cell phone? On, on a daily basis. Have you had the opportunity to validate your historical cell site analysis through other, and if so, how, how do you do that? Um, every day we take historical records and we go out and we determine a search area and we use that area you know, to say that a phone was located historically. And often we'll go out, we'll find surveillance video of the individual in that area. We'll find the phone in those search areas. Just uh, last night, or yeah, last night, I got a call in a stolen vehicle. And these vehicles now have, not to get too advanced, but these vehicles now have cellular capabilities. So I mapped out the, the, the records for the vehicle and I defined a search area and the team went out and they found the car right in the area that we said it would be. Um, I've mapped my own phone records. So every day we get asked to help um, in a position like, you know, in law enforcement, you know, help law enforcement, help search and rescue. We're able to validate. We say that we believe the phone to be in this area and routinely time after time after time, people are being found in that area. The phones are being found in that area. Um, like I said, surveillance videos show the person in the area. Um, license plate readers will capture somebody in that area. 
Um, <clears throat> so in uh, addition to, you talked about the, the cell phone providers providing training, have you received any additional training through the FBI or other means of, regarding historical health, cell site analysis? Uh, yes. Um, we're, we're constantly um, receiving continuing, continuing education, but a core part of my initial certification process back in 2010 and 11, it was trained by a, uh, a company called Emerging Technology Solutions. These are individuals that have um, a, a lot of experience. They have the background in RF um, technology as well as um, the locating of devices. In addition to uh, receiving training yourself, do you provide training to law enforcement agencies or other individuals? Yes, we do. And you, do you yourself do that? Yes, we've, we've taught hundreds of officers up here in Alaska. I've taught in several states throughout the country. I was actually just in Japan to work with the, the host government over there to help educate them on cellular um, uh, called detail records, as well as we've worked with our counterparts in Canada, um, as well as other, other countries in Africa. Have you been qualified and testify as an expert in the area of historical cell site analysis previously? Uh, yes, I have. And how many times would you say you've been qualified as an expert? I want to say this is probably over 65 times. This would be my 65th time. And in what, um, where across the United States has that happened? There's dozens of states. I, I believe I've testified tw uh, three times here, twice in federal court in Alaska, once in state court here in Alaska. Um, you, I mean, Cal California, Colorado, Washington, New York, Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, um, Florida. Uh, there's several other states too. Judge, at this time, I would move to offer Special Agent Perry uh, as an expert in the field of historical cell site analysis and cellular technology. No objection. The court recognizes him as an expert in that field. Special Agent Perry, were you asked to complete some historical cell site analysis for this particular case? Um, yes, I was. How did you um, originally become involved in this particular case? Give me a second. Sure. Sorry. I talk fast, so if I need to slow down, just, just holler at me. Um, I believe it was in uh, the first part of October of 2019. I was contacted by uh, Detective Brendan Lee from the Anchorage Police Department who advised that they were actively working a, a homicide investigation. And they asked my, for my assistance to help uh, determine the location of the a particular cell phone um, during key times around uh, key locations. And were you able to provide that assistance? Yes, I was. Did you um, prepare a PowerPoint that to assist in the explanation of your analysis that was involved in this particular case? Yes, I did. Okay. This time, Judge, uh, may I approach the witness? Yes. Okay. And Special Agent Perry, I've showed you what's been marked at State's Exhibit 17. Do you recognize that? Uh, yes, I do. That's a copy of my exhibits. And is that the um, PowerPoint uh, that you have created to assist with an explanation of your analysis? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, <clears throat> can you um, see? And it's okay. Uh, at this time, Judge, I would like to move to admit exhibit number 17, have them explain it, and publish it to the jury. Um, just think we should do that after he testifies regarding it. I'm not sure what you're the the objection is that not enough foundation has been laid. Right, Judge. I think that we're premature here. Okay, I, sir, uh, Agent Perry, oh, could you look I through? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and ask a few more questions. Okay. Uh, uh, Officer, uh, Special Agent Perry, looking through that particular uh, PowerPoint that I've handed you, Exhibit 17, can you describe what we're looking at? What we're looking at here is approximately 27 pages. This uh, exhibit will include some examples or demonstrative slides to help present, to explain how call detail record analysis works and how cellular networks operate. And then I was also provided um, dates and times as well as addresses. Um, I guess they're relevant to the investigation. And I was asked to determine if uh, a cell phone was in the vicinity of those addresses during key dates and times. Um, one, so upon doing the analysis, I determined that the phone was in the vicinity of those addresses at key dates and times. I then created a, a visual depiction of where the cell towers were 
the direction they transmitted and received their signals in relation to those addresses. And that's what's contained in here. So you can visually see what I'm describing about a phone being in a particular area at a particular time. So can you briefly tell the jury how a cell phone works and communicates with a cellular network then? Your phones are constantly seeking the strongest and clear signal or the best quality signal. And they will transmit signals to and from your phone to the tower and back. When you're ready to make a phone call, you can press the phone numbers in or you can press the text numbers, you put the contact in, you'll hit send the green button, it'll send a message to the cell tower. And depending on where that person is that you're trying to connect to, it will actually route the call pretty much anywhere in the world now to that individual. Um, and then vice versa, if somebody's trying to reach you, they will actually, you know, the cell phone providers will have a general idea of where you're located. So a good example is I flew from Seattle to Anchorage um, two days ago. So now it would show my phone in the area of the SeaTac airport and my phone right, gets turned off, right? Because we're complying with the laws. And uh, so when I land in Anchorage, I turn it on. Well, then my phone registers with the network and it says, hey, Eric's phone is in the Anchorage, Alaska area. So any phone calls, make sure you route them to, to his phone up in Anchorage. That's where he's at. How does then a cell tower work? A cell tower is a, a fixed structure. I'm sure you've all seen them. Um, and we'll show you some pictures here uh, and they're included in the slides to show you examples. They will, they're fixed uh, structures that will transmit and receive the cell signals to and from a certain geographic area. When you make a call, how does that phone determine what tower it's gonna use or the tower decide which cell phone it's gonna pick up? A lot, it's looking for that strongest clear signal. So it's not necessarily the always gonna be the closest signal. Think about the line of sight. If you have a mountain, if you're down by, you know, down in Homer, you know, or down by Soldatna, you have mountains, right? Those mountains can impede the signal. So you might, you might have, a, uh, might not always be the closest cell tower because of mountains and structures. So think about the clear line of sight, right? So if you're driving up towards Wasilla, there's sometimes that you'll actually use a cell tower, not in Eagle River, but on the other side of the water because it's clear line of sight. So when you arrive in Anchorage and your phone registers, you're in Anchorage, how do you self, how does your cell phone company keep track of this? Um, well, again, when I turn my phone on, if I move to an area, if I move to a different, you know, part of the network, it will register, it's called registration. So when I, you know, so if I power my phone on, it automatically does a, a handoff or a check with the network to say, hey, here I am, I'm back on the network and I'm in the Anchorage market. And what kind of record is then kept with your cell phone records for something like that? Well, for that's that's the registration information, right? So that's registration. That information is not included in a record. It is available, like it is available for the network to see. But but with, if you have any kind of a smartphone, as soon as I turn that phone on, a lot of times I'll have a I'll have a voicemail waiting for me. I'll have text messages waiting for me. Um, there's so many apps that are running in the background that a lot it's going to generate a record, you know, pretty much all the time with these new smartphones. And that's the your cell phone, a cell phone company keeps those records of that kind of activity. Yes, they will keep records for voice, SMS or text messages in the data connections. Um, AT&T will keeps all three of them. Um, Verizon keeps all three of them. GCI keeps uh, I think GCI is now keeping all three voice, SMS and data as well. And why do the phone companies keep these kinds of records? These, um, a lot of times it's for billing, billing purposes and network optimization. Billing purposes, if you can imagine, remember the day where you can only, you might only have, you can only make 500 text messages. So they need to know, do you go over 500 text messages? Then they can bill you. If you have a 10 gigabyte data plan and you go over your data plan of 10 gigabytes, they can bill you. If you roam to another area, they can bill you. <laughs> Um, it's a billion dollar industry, um, and that's predominantly a reason why these are kept. But then they also can determine the cell towers and sectors that you're using. So if your call fails or your call drops, and, and, and around here in Alaska, you, you have a lot of dead zones. If your call continuously fails because there's not enough cell towers in the area, they can go back, look at these records and see what towers you hit, and then figure out if there's enough people who, whose phone you know, calls keep dropping, then they can potentially come in and look at that as maybe they need to add a tower or adjust or, or provide additional coverage. 
So with these records, can you determine the general location of a cell phone by using these uh, cell site records reported by the phone company? Yes, you can, and we do that every day. And how do you do that? Um, like I stated before, the, the information in the cell phone records will tell you the date and time of the event. It'll tell you the type of the event. It'll tell you who's talking to who, but it also will tell you the cell tower that was used often for the beginning of the call and the ending of the call. And it'll tell you what direction on that cell tower is used. Using a publicly available um, map, you could use do this in Google Earth, you can do it in Google Maps. The cell phone providers also will tell you where the cell towers are located. They will also tell you the direction, what we call an orientation or a compass heading, what direction each sector transmits and receives its signal. So um, as you, you can put GPS coordinate of where the tower exists, and you can actually, back in the day, before we had, you know, you know, you know, programs that could do this automatically in bulk, we would hand, we'd have to overlay a compass on top of the cell tower, determine the compass heading that a sector covers, and then we'd have to we draw our sectors that way. Switching gears a little bit, um, are you familiar with Google location history? Yes. Folks, we're going to have to go through some things, and uh, we're going to have to do that outside your presence. So we're going to take a quick break and then you can come back. I was just referring to you. I said special agent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the record, the jury's left the courtroom. As I understand the objection, the objection is pages, the final pages, the final four pages, which show uh, satellite photography of. Uh, downtown and midtown anchorage and have labels on them for various locations and uh one of which is near the mulcahy stadium baseball stadium one of which is let's see, one of which is near cars and gamble, one of which is uh, near the Shell station. Uh, the corner of 15th and Ingra, and one of which is the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church in the park nearby. Uh, the objection is that, that this is late discovery and that the that the locations shown on those maps were not um, included in timely discovery. Am I understanding the objection correctly? Um, Judge, the objection is late notice. We received notice only last week that this witness was going to be testifying to this information. Uh, his original expert notice that we were provided did not include an advisement that he was going to be testifying as to locations of any cell phones on September 19th. So our objection is late disclosure. This was due 45 days before trial and we didn't receive it until yeah. mid-trial. But only as to those locations that I just listed? Correct. The pages on, I don't want to get this wrong, 20... 23, 24, 25, and 26. Okay. The state's counter is 
Judge, the state's counter is twofold. The information provided on these slides has been in the possession of defense counsel. The Google data since, I can give you dates, since 2020, 11, 17, 2020 defenses had the defendant's Google data. And, and in what form was that provided? The Google, in what form was it provided? Yes. To the in the form that it was received from Google, an exact duplicate copy of what which would be the records that uh, Mr. Special Agent Perry is relying on. So are we talking about a printout that lists uh, a bunch of information? It was provided digitally, Judge, to in a digital format to Defense Counsel actually two times. Once uh, on a CD um in march of 2021 and it was provided also electronically uh to defense counsel on 11 17 2020. his cell phone data was also provided uh to defense counsel several times over the course of the years we've actually duplicated a number of pieces of discovery the um federal search warrant that mentions the google uh his Google location records being tracked on these days uh, was discovered to defense counsel on January 20, 2023. And this, uh, the federal search warrant actually goes through this exact time frame that we have in the in these depicted um, slides that defense is objecting to showing Mr. Smith's activities on the 19th of September and the locations around the Shell gas station, around Shiloh Baptist Church, around um, the Sullivan Arena area. So this is not what you're relying on for that statement. Can I show you? Is that what you said? Yes, Judge? yes absolutely. So I'm looking at pages 11 through 13 of someone's report. That's the federal search warrant that the federal government got that we provided in discovery to defense counsel a year ago, over okay. a year ago. And this is the affidavit in support of that yes. warrant? Okay. Would you like to see the full affidavit, Judge? I'm, I I, I'm willing to trust you. Oh. I'm just clarifying what I'm looking at. So these are uh, representations that were made to the court. And I'll note that pages 12 and 13 do have maps of the aerial, aerial uh, yeah, maps that show some of these locations, all of them actually probably, uh, just at a different scale and perhaps. Do you have an argument to make about that? Um, simply just that there's a difference between what we're provided in discovery and what the state intends to rely on in trial. If they're intending to elicit testimony like that from an expert witness at trial. We are owed notice of that at least 45 days prior to trial and didn't get that here. So are you objecting to all of the testimony at this point or just just the just items that we've talked about? Okay. Uh, do you have a response to the assertion that was just made that they didn't get notice of this expert? Judge, they had notice of the information that the expert is relying on. This is a federal FBI agent that wrote this affidavit with the information that's been provided to defense counsel for years now. And we're having our expert explain that to the jury. It's information that's always been in this case. So I don't think that um, the amended notice of experts is inappropriate. It's not new information. Yeah. I'm going to look up the amended. Okay. You, you can go back to your so Thank you. I'm going to look up the amended notice. The supplemental notice is what I have. So 
so so the defense did have a timely notice that special agent perry was going to testify correct okay i misunderstood your argument no you're no we're not arguing the original expert notice it's like the amended one that included this information was provided last week yeah it's called the supplemental notice of expert and it's dated february 4 2024. and judge the information oh, i'm sorry and what it says is in addition In addition to the previously filed notice of expert, the state gives notice that Eric Perry may be asked to provide information as to the analysis of location data related to the defendant's devices in the days leading up to September 4, 2019, as well as in the days after, including the time frame of September 19 through 20, 2019. Based on location data information previously provided to the defendant in discovery, including AT&T records for the phone number, Google records associated with Google accounts, Brian Smith, AK, and Bradley Phillips, AK, as well as bait stamps 3162 through 3167. While this information has been previously provided to the defense, exhibits and or accompanying PowerPoint presentations may create it and provide provided prior to Mr. Perry's testimony. So is there a rule that prohibits, I mean, my understanding of expert testimony is that experts can can render opinions based on inform among other things information presented to them at trial is there a rule that anything that uh prohibits they're, they're, if they do produce record uh reports there's an obligation to provide those obviously but that doesn't limit them to what is said in the report unless I'm missing something. Um, it, it, it may be that your honor and I read uh, rule 16 B one B differently. I read it as to require at least 45 days notice of the sort of amendment to testimony and substance of testimony that uh, we're hearing here today. The rule I was referring to is rule 703 evidence rule 703 which says the facts or data in the particular case upon which an expert bases an opinion or inference may be those perceived by or made known to the expert at or before the hearing. Facts or date, data need not be admissible, etc. Um, so what rule 16 B one B requires is uh, notice that prosecutors required to inform the defendant of the names and addresses of an expert witness performing work in the connection with the case. Sounds like that's occurred. Prosecution, prosecution shall also make available for inspection, copying any reports or written statements of these experts. So to the extent they have them, they're obligated to provide them. I don't read this rule as limiting the expert's opinion at trial to whatever um, was included in, in the report 45 days earlier, because it's always the rule that you, you, know, you don't know what will come out of trial necessarily. And it's always the rule that the expert can provide an opinion on, based on evidence produced at trial. So I'm going to, and especially given the notice, the pre previous notice and the maps that I just described a little while ago and the uh, narrative that accompanies those maps in the affidavit, I'm gonna find that, this, that there's no unfair surprise here or unfair notice. And I'll allow the, the state to explore the final four pages I won't, I won't deem them admissible, inadmissible uh, on the basis of untimely notice. Is there anything else we need to cover before we bring the jury back in? Can I approach about an unrelated technical issue? Yes. Someone will. I'm not responsible. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're ready for jurors. 
Ready for jurors? Yes, Judge. I think Mr. Yeah. Here. Okay. Let's bring them in. Please be seated, everyone. We've got our jury back with us. We've got everyone else here that we need to have in order to resume trial in the Brian Stephen Smith case. And um, thank you for your patience, folks. We're ready to proceed. You may continue your questioning. Thank you, Judge. Um, Special Agent Perry, are you familiar with Google location history? Yes, Sam. And can you explain to the jury what that is? Um, Google location history is another. Um, well, Google is its own company, and Google maintains and collects uh, a, a ton of information on their devices and the usage, um, especially if you have a Gmail account or if you're using an Android device such as a Samsung. Um, Google will collect uh, location history um, from that from those devices. The location history can be extremely precise. It can be GPS based. I've seen it down to three meters, which is pretty much going to be between the judge and myself, um, as well as they will use the surrounding Wi-Fi um, access points to determine your location. And they'll also determine, um, use the cellular towers um, to determine the locations of this, these devices. And that information is maintained um, by Google in uh, one of their, in their databases. And were you, uh, was there any Google location history or data involved in this case? Uh, yeah, there's there's a substantial amount in this case. Were you asked to review cell phone records for cellular number 907-205-6883 yes. in this case? Yes, it was. And how about cellular number 907-390-7035? Yes, it was. And um, <clears throat> what all did you review in conducting your analysis um, that you were that we that law enforcement was requesting of you of your services? Uh, initially, I was asked to review the cell phone records or the call detail records for the phone number ending, I believe it was 6883, um, to determine if that phone traveled to areas where, um, uh, where potential remains, human remains could be searched for. That was the initial request that I received from Anchorage Police Department. Um, and I assisted them in determining us uh, an area down on the Seward Highway, um, kind of between Anchorage, I believe, and Gurwood, um, where which stood out to me since it was the phone was being used around 1 a.m. in the morning, uh, not much out there uh, at 1 a.m. And was that for the cell phone 907-205-6883? Yes, it was. And what are the, what is that? Who is associated with that particular phone number? Uh, the the subscriber for that phone is uh, Brian Smith. And on the 907-390-7035, who is that phone number associated with? I believe that's associated to an individual named Ian Calhoun. And after reviewing the records that you were uh, that were collected in this case, the Google location, the cell phone records, did you create maps or slides as part of your analysis? Yes, I did. And is that exhibit number, state's exhibit number 117? Yes, it is. At this time, Judge, I would move to admit and publish the jury exhibit 117. Events have any more no, nothing further. argument? Okay, it's admitted and you may publish. And Special Agent Perry, could you turn the TV as soon as it, there we go, a little bit towards the jury so they can see it better, but always, and allow also the judge to still see it. <laughs> That's probably good right there. That's good. I see it. Okay, good. Can you see it, Judge? Okay, still? I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, 
And is this uh, page one of your your uh, PowerPoint that you created? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Can you explain to the jury what we're looking at here on this PowerPoint? Um, this is actually just a, a, this is page one of my exhibits. This is just a cover sheet to advise the phone numbers that I analyzed, as well as the Google location history or the Google account, the Gmail account that I also uh, analyzed. And that's the the 907, the 205 number, the 2390 number, and then Brian Smith's, uh, Brian Smith, aka at Google, at gmail.com's history for yes, the records. Okay. This is page two of your um, slides. What is this? Uh, can you explain this to the jury? Uh, this is just to explain to you guys how we do what we do. Um, like I stated a couple of times now, the cell phone records or the call detail records will have certain information um, to include the date and time, the cell towers and sectors that were utilized. And this is just what, uh, just a basic summary of what I was asked to do in this matter um, by Anchorage Police Department, as well as how we go about um, doing the actual analysis. Here's page three, what, what is this? Um, not also, this is, these are examples of several cell towers, different how formats they come in. Um, here in Anchorage, we do have a lot of the poles. You guys have seen them as you drive around town. You see a lot of the metal poles, but you, you'll also see these antennas. There's like gray and white little rectangular shapes. Those are called, those are the actual cellular antennas. Those are the devices that transmit and receive their signals. Um, like I stated in New I worked in New York City for about nine and a half years. So we can't really, we didn't really have the, the facility or the place to install, uh, they didn't have a, the space to put up a bunch of metal towers. So you would often see the antennas affixed to like water towers to the sides of buildings. So even though this is what a typical cell tower looks like up here in Alaska, they may also like uh, 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 on the side of the hospital, there's a, you know, you'll see a bunch of these antennas affixed to the, the hospital. The next slide, can you explain what we're looking at here? Um, this is just an example, a visual depiction of what I described earlier. Um, the cellular networks and cell towers are designed to provide um, a coverage in a 360 degree coverage area. And what we will do is you can map out the cell tower, which will be the center of this compass setting. And then the cell phone providers will tell you what direction compass heading, which you'll see zero, you know, zero being due north, 90 being due east, 180 degrees being due south, and 270 degrees being due west. Right now, each um, generally, cell towers are divided into three sectors. Each sector covering approximately 120 degrees. So when you add three sectors up, that'll give you the 360 degree coverage. So in this case here, this cell tower will be located here, and then sector one, as indicated here, would transmit and receive its signals to a kind of a northeast direction or at a 60 degree azimuth. And then the approximate sector boundaries would be the lines extended towards zero and then 120. That gives you your approximate 120 degree coverage. Now these lines aren't hard and fast on earth. They're gonna, there's things called overlapping coverage. So if you're to drive from Anchorage today to Wasilla, you could be on one phone call and your phone will continuously be handed off from tower to tower to tower, and that's what's called overlapping coverage. Moving on to slide uh, five. You're going to see in the slides coming up, you'll see the slide, you'll see um, exhibits like this overlaid on a map. So what we call, with, with the blue pie wedge is called the sector. The pointy part here will be where the tower is located. This shaded area here, it, it doesn't reflect the actual coverage of the tower, but it will depict what direction the cellular frequencies are transmitted and received by the sector that was used by the target cell phone. And based on this, we can say that the tower is located here. And then in this case, the phone would have to be kind of to the set, to the east, to the southeast, to the south in this area. And as you said, those are gonna be seen on some of the additional slides we're about to see. Yes. Okay. Slide six, what is this? You're also going to see some icons on these maps that will represent what is a Google location um, point versus a cellular point. Um, in the slide, you'll see a blue you'll see a blue icon which will represent the Google, the Google location. And like I said, you'll also see what's called the radius. You'll see sometimes it might be down to 27 meters, but
but there might be up to other times where it might be fairly large up to 2,500 meters. <coughs> but this is kind of what you'll see up here. There'll be a blue icon with a, with a shaded area, a circle, and that's the, you know, the probable area in which the phone will be located. Slide seven. Um, you're gonna see a lot of icons on the maps. Um, you may have already heard about several of these addresses. Um, this is just to indicate what the location is and what icon represents what location that I was asked to determine if a phone was in that particular area or the general area at a particular time. And were you provided this information by law enforcement as to um, potential locations that during the investigation that they wanted you to look at? Yes. Slide number eight. We are getting into the actual analysis of the phone number ending in 6883, as well as Google location for Brian Smith, AK at gmail.com. In this instance, this is, a, I was asked, was this phone in the vicinity of Walmart near you know, Benson Road, approximately on September 3rd, around nine, I believe it was 942. I was provided some receipts of a Walmart. Um, I can't remember the timestamp. I want to say around the 940 hour. I think it was actually like 9, 918 to 940. There's two different receipts. And in, when I analyzed the AT&T call detail records, I noticed that the phone was utilizing, was sending text messages on September 3rd at 2019 at 929 and 942 using this cell tower in sector. This cell tower in sector transmits and receives a signal directly towards the Walmart. So this blue wedge or sector is the AT&T cell phone records. At the same time, I located several Google location histories um, points ranging from 23, 23 meters to 122 meters that are also within the direct vicinity of Walmart. And that was between the hours of 918 through 944 p.m. on the 3rd, which was consistent with the time of the receipts. Moving then on to slide number nine. I was then asked, did this phone travel towards uh, the Marriott, the Marriott Hotel on or about late on the evening of the third into the early morning hours of the fourth? I did locate several. Um, we had three different data events, or actually four. We had three data events up here, and we had one text message down here. The blue sectors are the sectors that were used by the AT&T phone, 9883, I'm sorry, 6883. Um, up top, it was 1217. 117 and 217. The phone was utilizing that tower and sector that transmits and receives its signal towards the Marriott Hotel. And then there's a text message here that happened at 1254 a.m. where it utilized this tower just south of the Marriott Hotel. There was also several locations uh, events for the Google location ranging from 25 meters to 208 meters between the hours of 12 a.m. to 259 a.m. that were in the direct vicinity of the Marriott Hotel. Slide number 10. I was then asked, did, did the phone 6883 travel towards a park known by Forsyth Park? Um, and was it being used in that vicinity around the same time a phone number associated to Ian Calhoun, Calhoun was also in the same, you know, was his phone also in the same vicinity? What you're looking at here is on September 4th of 2019, at starting you have, again, the cell towers that were being used so yeah, the cell tower is here and the cell tower here. So this phone was located in the vicinity of the Forsyth Park, um, as well as you have the purple icons, the Cajon residence. The green is the Forsyth Park area. And you have calls from the 6883 that was using this tower at 446, 447, 453. Those are text messages. And then you have a voice call where it was using this tower over here. Both of these towers and sectors transmit and receive their signals toward Fort Soy's Park. At the same time, I had multi, uh, three different Google location hits with a GPS as a source, three meters, four meters, and five meters at 426, I'm sorry, 446 hours that puts it right in the vicinity of Fort Soy's Park. So as I understand that slide, all of those blue boxes where you're showing Google location, cell phone, text messages, those are all in relation to Mr. Smith's telephone number, correct? Uh, to his Gmail account, I'm sorry. which is associated to that. And then over here on the left side is a zoomed in um, call out box. So you can actually see the, the Google location in relation to Forsyth Park. 
So that is also cell phone, that's cell phone analysis and, and Google, correct on there? Yes, on this slide? Is, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Slide number 11. I was asked to determine was a phone number associated to Mr. Calhoun also in the general vicinity of the Forsyth Park. Now, these are for the same time period, on um, September 4th, 2019, between 446 and 456, there was two text messages and two, uh, three text messages and an outbound phone call between Mr. Calhoun's phone and Mr. Smith's phone. And it was used, utilized in this tower and sector in the direct vicinity of Mr. Calhoun's residence, um, as well as, I mean, obviously it's the, his residence right there, Forsyth Park is the green icon. Slide number 12. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the last two slides, just to show you the, the location, the cell towers that Mr. Calhoun's, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith's phone was using with the Google location, Forsyth Park, Mr. Calhoun's residence. On the left, on the right is Mr. Calhoun's cell phone activity in comparison to his residence as well as Forsyth Park. Slide number 13. This was part of my initial um, analysis. I was asked to determine, did Mr. Smith's phone travel anywhere of interest that would seem out of the normal um, anchor, downtown Anchorage area? And I noticed on September 5th, um, around 11.31, between 11.31 and 12.15 a.m., his phone was being utilized near a residence of 1353 Staubach Circle in Anchorage. And then it, um, and that was at 11.31 and 12.15. And there'll be a zoomed in picture, I believe, next. Is that slide number 14? Correct. This includes the calls from the previous slides, but it also has all of the Google location history between the hours of 12.15 and 12.39 a.m. where the Google location is in the direct vicinity of the Stalbuck residence. And the last one, I believe, was at 12.39 a.m. Then moving on to slide 15. I was able to determine that this phone was utilizing cell towers in South Anchorage along the Seward Highway later on um, around between the hours of 12, uh, 1231 and 1249 a.m. And obviously, which would show a movement of the phone from the towards the residence towards the southern part on its way, like I said, along the southern uh, Seward, or Seward Highway. So per your previous slide, the phone was at the a residence on 1353 Staubach Circle. And then after 1239 AM, it starts moving south. Correct. Okay. Slide 16. Uh, this is just a zoomed in image. This was just to show the relation. You know, it's not really, it's only relevant in the sense that it was a cell tower south in South Anchorage along Seward Highway. And that's just further indication that you saw it moving, the phone was moving south? Yes. Okay. Slide 17. Uh, this is uh, where the cell phone 6883 was utilizing cell towers actually across the water in Hope um, uh, down here. And then in comparison to the location in which the body was, uh, human remains were recovered. And this is between the hours of 106 to 114, I'm sorry, to 119. So you talked earlier about lines of sight for cell phone towers. Does that mean actually someone was in Hope at the time that those? things are pinging off those towers? Um, not, it, it could be, but most more consistent with the phone probably being on the Seward Highway. And this is the example where I was talking about clear line of sight and how the phone will often connect to towers that it is, has a clear line of sight. And here there is no buildings, there's no mountains, there's no obstructions to impede the signal. How about slide 18? Does that help further explain how someone on the highway might be pinging off of other areas? Yes. Okay. What are we looking at here? This is kind of a busy slide, but this um, AT&T can also provide a, um, a location. It's called Nellos, which is the network estimation location of where they believe the phone to be. It's similar to Google location, but they'll provide you a GPS point and it'll provide you a uh, radius of where the phone is likely to be found. So we have the cell towers from the previous slide mapped out here. And then we also have two Nellos hits here. The radius is fairly large, 2,500 meters on both of these. That was at 107.45 and 107.43 on the sixth. But then we also have a Google location um, event that occurred at um, 107 and 25 
seconds. And all of this is consistent with being in the area of where the, the set of human remains were found. Slide number 19. This contains the same data as prior, the prior slide, except for the cell, cell sites from Hope. And just to kind of show you a satellite overview, um, I believe the rainbow trailhead is, I believe that's where the rainbow trailhead should be. And it, this is just more of a, a cleaner, less busy side to show you the locations via satellite. Slide number 20. Um, I continue to determine the general location of this phone and realize that the phone returned to the An downtown Anchorage area around 1.24 a.m. And that's where the cell tower is located up here. Slide 21. This is just a zoomed in image of that call at 124, just to show that the phone was being utilized in the downtown Anchorage area. So um, the streets on that street, so so you're not from Anchorage, correct? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay, so uh, looking at that map, it says Northern Lights Boulevard, correct? Yes. I'm okay, sure. so the blue on the left shows that he was in, that's actually, to correct you, it's Midtown Anchorage, not downtown okay. <laughs> with Northern Lights Boulevard. Okay, so that is showing that his phone was pinging in the Midtown area. You have a residence on the right, but his, his phone is pinging from that tower there on the left. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, slide 22. Um, I was also provided, I was asked to determine was, uh, was this phone located in the vicinity of a McDonald's on uh, West Northern Lights Boulevard in Anchorage around the hours of, uh, I believe it was 156, 150 AM. And I located, uh, there was a, a, a connection with the network where the phone actually was utilizing a cell tower here at approximately 156 and 46 seconds. And that's the orange is gonna be the location of the McDonald's. Slide number 23. Um, I was asked to determine, um, the, I was given additional four addresses and to determine to, if this, if the phone could have been located in the vicinity of these addresses on the, you know, on or about uh, September 19th or September 20th. And I observed that at approximately on September 19th at approximately 1.58 AM to 2.07 AM, there were several Google events that placed the phone in the vicinity of the car's grocery store um, located um, you know, actually right there, I believe that's 30, uh, 13th Street and Seward Highway. Okay, slide 24. I was also asked to determine if this phone was also in the vicinity of the Sullivan Arena um, on the same, around the same time period or shortly thereafter. And I located several Google events um, between the hours of 3.27 a.m. through 3.59 a.m. where the phone was utilizing or was located in the vicinity of the Sullivan Arena. Slide 25. Uh, I was then provided an address of the Shell gas station to determine if it was also located in the vicinity of the Shell gas station around, a, I believe it was in the 4 a.m. hour of uh, September 19th. And between the hours of 4.14 and 4.35, the Brian Smith, aka at gmail.com device was located in the direct vicinity of the Shell gas station at East 15th and Ingra. Slide 26. Um, I believe this is the final address. I was asked to determine if it was in the vicinity of the Shiloh Baptist uh, Missionary or Missionary uh, Baptist Church on the, you know, at any point during September 19th in the morning hours. And I did locate several Google events at 6.47 a.m. to 7.13 a.m. where that phone was in the vicinity of the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. So um, I believe that's the, the last slide, correct? It is. Yeah. Okay. These particular addresses and locations um, were provided to you um, to look to see if there's any records that correlate with those particular addresses and locations, correct? Correct. You didn't actually investigate this case yourself, so don't really under, so is that correct? Correct. I, okay. My role was for the device location information. Okay. Those are all the questions I have for Special Agent Perry. Um, possibly. Okay. Yeah. We'll figure out when we get there. Um, Special Agent Perry. Can we have, uh, oh, yeah. turn the TV just back the other way? Thank you. 
Special Agent Perry, um, you Morning. don't, uh, your job is to pull data off of these, uh, sorry, you uh, pull data from the cell phone companies and interpret the data, right? Uh, yeah, we, we interpret the data that we retain from the cell phone providers, sir. You, you don't, and, and I'm going to, I may have to ask this question differently if it's unclear, but you don't collect the data yourself. You ask the cell phone company to collect it and provide it to you, right? The, yeah, the cell phone providers collect it through their normal course of businesses and upon a legal request, such as a search warrant or sometimes exigent circumstance, they will provide the records. And your office doesn't maintain the towers that the data is collected from, right? Um, do we do any service? No, all of the cell, I think, are you asking if we, we have nothing to do with the cell towers? Those are all maintained by the cell phone providers. Right. They're maintained and calibrated by the cell phone providers. If if needed, they will they will go out and actually you know troubleshoot it if it's needed. That's not something that your office does. No, we would not. So you can't attest to the the calibration of the accuracy of the towers, right? Um, well, I can 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 I when we look at the totality of the circumstances, I would say that as far as maintenance, what are you, are you asking? What are you asking? You don't you don't provide the maintenance. You don't do the testing on them anything like oh, that. No, I do not. So you you provide on essentially the raw data that's provided to you from the cell phone companies. Yes, we do. And the cell phone companies are the ones who maintain and service and calibrate the towers themselves. Yes, they do. And those towers also provide, uh, I think we saw in your exhibits, to an extent, some estimates, right? As far as? For example, we, we saw in your report that while, you know, for example, if we're going back to the uh the slide where you're talking about the hope towers correct right yes. and we saw 2500 meters on that right that's those are yeah I just, I just want to be clear I, I you're talking about the nellos data yeah versus cell tower data two different data sets okay why don't you explain the difference okay um it's so it's so at t can optimize their network and they can determine the, the locations where their users are at they will collect that Nellos data. It's called the network estimated location of the of where the phones are. Those are network derived. Um, there's several different ways that they can derive that location from. So the 2,500 meters is relation to that one coordinate where they said we believe the phone to be in this area and we believe it to be within a 2,500 meter radius. Now the cell tower information that's different, right? Mm -hmm. so that, that's where you have the cell tower and sectors. Mm -hmm. Right, and so the Nellos data, it says, here's the center of the point where we think it might be, but it could be, and, and, and this is where I want some clarification. We saw the point, we saw a circle around it. Is that a, a radius of 2,500 meters, so a diameter of 5,000 meters? Yes, sir, it is. Yeah, okay. that's yep. So it could be on this side of the circle, or it could be 5,000 meters away on this side of the circle. It could be anywhere with, if, you only, if you're only looking at one point, mm -hmm. you have to, you know, if you're looking at one point and using that theory, yes, it could be anywhere within, it's going to most likely be found anywhere within that 2,500 meter radius, which is now a 5,000 meter diameter. So feasibly, there is a difference of 5,000 meters to where that phone could have been. Yes, sir. That's true. Yep. And when you're looking at the Google location data, that does give you, again, a point in the middle of, I think, a 2,500 meter radius. For, for example, for that one, for example, if it says 2,500 meters, that's the radius of the circle where that point might be. And are you still talking about hope? Uh, I, I'm talking Google data in general. Okay. And that's what I listed. You'll see some of the radiuses are very tight, down to three, four meters, versus this one, um, which was 2,500 meters as well, um, with the Google location. And as I hinted in my last set of questions, and I, and, and I think you've made this clear, what you're tracking is the location of a cellular device. That is correct. Sir. You're not putting that in the hands of any particular person. No, not at that. My job is to look at the phone records for the phone number and determine the general locations. Okay. So, for example, if somebody's phone is stolen, you're not tracking that person's location. You're tracking the location of the person who stole the phone. It's the device I'm tracking. Right. All right. Thank you. That's all I have, George. So uh, one of the questions you were just asked is about the validity of cell phone towers because the FBI does not clearly does not maintain the cell phone towers. Are there ways that um, your analysis uh, verifies the validity of the information provided by those towers? 
um, as I stated before, um, we're constantly, you know, we're using, the, you know, we're, we're mapping the, the, we're providing the information from the cell phone providers that tell us the directions in which the towers provide service. And we routinely go out and routinely find um, the phones and those devices in those areas. Um, we actually map out our, our own um, phone records. We also do, a, a, we, we drive tests. So we actually map out, we actually go out and map out the footprints and the, the coverage area of, of those cell towers as well. So we're, we're constantly evaluating um, the coverage area of these towers. And on that one slide uh, that showed the, what you called the busy slide that showed the Nelos, ta the Hope, Hope Towers, the Nelos, um, the Google information uh, along the Seward Highway where the body was recovered. Those are all three different uh, methods of collecting data, correct? Correct. Or looking at data? Correct. Okay. And based on that was, based on the review of all three of those types of data, were those consistent with each other? Yes, they were. Okay. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you. You're done. Thank you, Special Agent. You finished with your test for you want me to leave this here? Yeah, we'll, we'll handle you. it. Thank you. Judge of State now calls Michael Harris. Okay, we've got an exhibit here at the oh, table. Yeah. Let's put that with the exhibits. Good morning, sir. Up, up here next to me, please. You have to make your way past that screen there. Please remain standing, raise your right hand, and we'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the, the testimony? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you'll give in this case? I will swear the court the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Please state your name. Michael Harris, H A R R I S. Good morning, Mr. Harris. Where do you work? The Alaska Railroad. What do you do for the Alaska Railroad? I'm a heavy equipment operator. How long have you worked for the Alaska Railroad? Going on 30 years. I want to take you back to October of 2019. Uh, were you working along on the railroad along the Seward Highway? I was. What, uh, what were you doing? Um, what kind of work were you doing along the Seward Highway in early October? We call it ditching. It's uh, to keep the ditches clear for drainage. How do, what does that work involved exactly? We use an excavator that's powered by the uh, a cart that actually cleans the ditch for us. Uh, we just keep it clear so water can flow and not end up washing out the tracks. And is this a one person job, two person job? It's usually a two person job. I'll run the high rail and get the authority. And the other operator obviously will be operating the excavator. What's a high rail? It is a regular pickup truck with high rail gear. It's able to go down the rail. And were you, um, did you have a coworker then with you when you were running this equipment back in early October of 2019? Yes, I did. Okay, and who was that? Roger Strickland. And is, uh, did you or Mr. Strickler um, have an, a reason to contact your, your investigator for the railroad? Yes, he had uh, spotted something. He wanted me to come look at it. I did, and uh, what I was, was that? I'm sorry. What what, what did you what, something? What was the something? It looked like skeletal remains. Okay, and it was Mr. Strickler that spotted it first. Yes. Okay. Was he in his rig at the time? Yes. Okay. What did you do? I uh, got out, came and took a look, and then I decided it was time to make a phone call. Okay. And who did you call? I called our special agent. Okay. And um, ultimately, did the Anchorage Police Department arrive? Yes. Okay. And did you speak with officers? Yes. Okay. Um, can you describe what you saw in your words? Uh, well, it looked like skeletal remains in a fetal position, curled up. Um, they looked very small. What area <clears throat> of the tracks was this? Did this occur? On the east side, what we call the east side or the mountain side close to the road, it wasn't on the water side. 
the that's where the you found the remains yes okay what area is there a specific specific area of the railroad there's um, a siding there called rainbow okay and what does that mean uh it's just the names of the uh, sidings we we have several names for all the sidings that we have and that's the what's that particular one is called it uh, deviates from the main line so trains can clear there and by siding, uh, do you mean where actually two sets of train tracks go side by side? That is correct. Okay. Um, can you describe generally the weather in that area? Windy most of the time, whether it's sunny or raining. Do you find, um, at, when you're ditching, do you find a lot of debris? Yes. Is that often what you're clearing out of the ditch is debris versus yes. other things? Okay. Yes. What, what are the variety of debris that you do find in the ditch there? In that particular area uh rocks vegetation it depends on the weather of course but yeah and is it safe to say you find things that fly off of people's trucks wood yes siding uh, you know whatever construction might be driving by hubcaps everything you name it okay. yeah And it was, uh, I'm sorry, was it you or Mr. Strickler that ended up calling the investigator? I did. Okay. And why did you decide to call your investigator? Because um, we weren't sure what we would have found, but it needed an expert eye. Okay. Did he come out and look at it? He didn't. He sent the uh, APD out. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Those are all the questions I have for Mr. Harris. No problem. You're done, sir. Thank you. Next, we'll call uh, Mr. Strickler. You're next to me, sir. Yeah. Good, good morning. Good morning. Remain standing. Please raise your right hand and we'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this case on the court to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please receive them. Please state your name and spell your last name. My name is George Roger Strickler. S T R I C K L E R. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Strickler. Good morning. Did you work for the Alaska Railroad in 2019? Yes, I did. Do you currently work for the railroad? I do not. I'm retired. Okay. Uh, in 2019, were you um, what we've now heard ditching the term ditching with uh, Mr. Harris in early of October of 2019 along the Seward Highway? That is correct. Okay. Can you describe for us um, what your job was that day? Well, my job is to run the excavator it's about, that's sitting on the tracks, and uh, I dig out the ditches and rocks or anything that are alongside the, the arm or anywhere else, and <clears throat> that's what I do. The backhoe itself, does it, does it have its own ability to go on the train tracks, or does it have to sit on a, um, a cart and then it sits on top of that? It sits on a cart, and uh, so you're way up high. It's a what they call a 320 size. So it weighs like about 50,000 pounds. How does the cart itself move down the tracks? Hydraulically off of the uh, pumps on the uh, backhoe. So you can actually drive the cart from the backhoe the, right by itself. It doesn't have to be pushed or pulled. That's correct. Okay. And so you are actually quite high up when you're working in the. Yes, okay. I would say probably 15 feet up there. Okay. When you um, were ditching, were you ditching that day in the area of what we have now know is called rainbow siding? That is what is the rainbow siding area? It's just a small area so that we can park uh, extra cars or, you know, it's just a siding track and uh, you have the main track that goes through and then you, you set any type of car in there or small equipment, like we, we park our equipment in our lot. And what is the purpose of ditching? What are you doing? Well, the... Uh, down on the arm, there is just tons of rocks that fall off the banks and they just fill the ditches in. And, and so we go along and uh, ditch them out and clean them. Do you also find other things other than rocks? Uh, yeah, we find 
all kinds of stuff. People throw off this highway there because it's real close to the highway, you know, the main highway. Is it also a windy area in the rainbow siding area? Real windy most of the time, yeah. Is it uh, common for things to probably fly off of trucks or cars or whatever uh, and land yeah. in this? And the tracks are the when they haul all their uh, uh, stuff into Whittier and stuff, you know, they have just tons of stuff that flies on the ground. Off the train, off the train cars themselves. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I want to take you back to early October um, of 2019. Do you recall finding um, some skeletal remains while you were ditching that in on a day on a particular day? That is correct. Okay. I did. Uh, do you remember the exact day? No, what's that again? Do you remember the exact day that that happened? Uh, not exactly, no. Um, if uh, if I told you October 2nd, 2019, does that sound about right? It sounds right, yeah, I, yeah. What did you actually see that day? Well, by me being up in the back hole, it was, it was still like nine o'clock or whatever. It was still a little bit dark, but I had all lights on. We have tons of light on it. It lights it up just like in this room right here. I mean, it, you can see everything. And being up high like that, you can see everything in the ditch within probably 30, 40 feet, 50 feet out, you know, just like plain as day. And did you, um, as you were ditching, did you find skeletal remains? Yes, I did. Okay. What, um, as you were ditching, how did, how did you discover those? Well, being setting up like I do on the back of, well, you can just look like, I could see everything right here where the, the bench is here. I mean, you could see everything over there. And uh, and when I reached down there, I, I could see the skeleton. So when you say reach down, I'm assuming you don't mean your hand. No, the back. Of, <laughs> okay. The back. Of, when you swing around, you're, you're swinging way over there and you can ditch all that ditch. It's just a ditch anywhere from four to five feet away from the tracks, maybe six feet. And, uh, and you just pull all the dirt out of it and get rid of it. When you um, saw the remains, had you actually, do you know if you had moved them with your backhoe or did you see them before you, the backhoe? Uh, I did. I didn't move them at all. Okay. I could see them. What did you do when you saw them? Well, I, I called Mike Harris because he was following me in a pickup truck and uh, we worked like in a team together. And so I called him on the radio and it says, hey, I, I think I found some remains of a body. Okay. And then um, did APD eventually respond? Uh, we called our special agent and uh, first and and told him that what we found and then he called the, the troopers and everybody and they all showed up. Okay. And did you remain there with the remains until law enforcement arrived? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, we had to when you when you get track, you go from mile to mile or a certain section of the track and you own that track until you give it up and and so we basically stayed there the whole day to, to keep so they could do their investigation. So, so you're keepers the of the track, so to speak? Yes. As a as a railroad worker? Okay. Yes. Even the trains or nothing can come through. Did it, did it actually that day interfere with the ability for trains to come through? Yes, it did. Okay. Do you recall how long you were out there sitting or keeping keeping the track, so to speak? I would say probably four to five, six hours. And is that both you and Mr. Harris required to do that as part of your job working for the that, railroad? That was part of our job. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Those are all the questions. Oh, actually, I have one more question. The area that um, that you found the remains, how would you describe the area between the ditch and the Seward Highway? Well, um, it's a real steep bank. I mean, it's really steep. Um, when the troopers showed up, they were basically falling down on the bank, trying to haul their stuff down. And it, it's really steep. I mean, it's real steep. Okay. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have for Mr. Harris. Okay. Uh, Mr. Strickler, you mean? I'm sorry, Mr. Strickler. I apologize, Mr. Strickler. Yeah. All right. No problem. Uh, so, Mr. Strickler, you were the, at least on the day in question, the first one to see the remains that you found? That is correct. And you were clearing the ditch in that process, but you had not gotten to that point in the ditch yet right that is correct and you didn't touch the remains never touched didn't affect them in any way not at all so when the investigators got there they were in exactly the same condition as when you would come exactly well i have judge no no follow-up judge you're done sir thank all you right. do we have a quick witness or should we take a break medium witness it's up to you judge 
Out of Brooks Field. Okay. Quick break. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, Council, given our previous discussions about jurors having some discomfort, I'm going to take more frequent breaks than that's fair, Judge. Otherwise, um, I noted it to Master Clerk and Council as well, but the jury sitting here closest to me, that chair breaks on him every day, several times a day. Okay. Thank you. I didn't realize that. Okay. Anything else before we break? No. Okay. Let's take our break. Smith is here, council are here. The jury's waiting back in the jury room. Are we ready to proceed, council? We are, Judge. Let's bring the jury. Please be seated, everyone. Have our jury back with us. It's 10 uh, 37 or 38. Everyone is here that needs to be here in order to proceed with trial in the Brian Smith case. Folks, I've been told that some of you are wondering about Monday, the schedule. We Monday's a holiday, so we won't be having trial on Monday. And we're ready to hear from the state's next witness. Thank you, Judge. This is Sergeant Jade Baker. Stand and raise your right hand and we'll swear you in, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony will give in a case now before this court to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please be seated and please state your name. So I Jade Baker, J A D E B A K E R. Sergeant, can I have you introduce yourself to the jury? Tell them who you are and where you work. Hello, I'm uh, Jade Baker. I'm currently the sergeant for the homicide unit. I've been with the Anchorage Police Department. It'll be 22 years this spring. Uh, I was assigned to the homicide unit for five years before promoting. I was in the special victims unit for nine years before that, vice for a couple of years, and then patrol before that. And um, did you, when did you promote to sergeant? It was uh, August of 2022. And um, have you recently returned to the homicide unit in that capacity? Yes, ma'am. I had to go back to the street to be a sergeant. So I did that for a year and a half. I just got the homicide sergeant job. So I'm, this is my first week back. So oh, Welcome okay. back, Sergeant. Thanks. In 2019, were you a detective in the homicide unit? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you said you did that work for about five years? Yes, ma'am. Okay. While you were a detective in the homicide unit, um, were you did you become involved on October 1st, 2019 in a case involving Brian Smith? Yes, ma'am. Who is the lead detective in that case? Detective Lee. Okay. And when a case comes in and a lead detective is assigned, what does everybody else do? We're all kind of in a support capacity. Uh, there's a second detective that's assigned to assist the first detective because you know people retire and move on and stuff. And then uh, other tasks are or doled out, like writing search warrants, conducting canvases, additional interviews, other follow-up is uh, is required. Okay. Um, is it fair to characterize the lead detective as kind of the quarterback of the investigation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then what was your role in this case? I was the uh, author of a lot of search warrants. I was uh, the one that wrote all the search, well, most of the search warrants for this case. Okay. And when you write a search warrant, how, what does that process look like? Like, where are you getting in the information? What are you providing to the court? You're uh, getting information as it comes in from uh, other officers and detectives, from their interviews with witnesses, and uh, their uh, the way they process, you know, the, the evidence that comes in. You a search warrant's kind of two parts. It's an affidavit and then an actual search warrant. So an affidavit's like a story or an account of all the information that happens in a chronological order, and it supports your uh, request to uh, search items or seize items, which you put on your search warrant portion of the search warrant. Based on evidence and information that the the APD received. On October 1st, 2019, did you apply on October 21st, or I'm sorry, on October 1st for a series of search warrants? 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. What search warrants did you apply for? If I may refresh my uh, report so I can read these numbers off to you. Okay. I don't know if we need the search warrant numbers, but what locations and items were you asking to search? On the first, I applied for five different search warrants. The first was uh, for the person of Brian Smith, date of birth 32371, uh, the AT&T Mobility Records Custodian, the uh, town place by Marriott, room uh, 323, which is at 600 East 32nd Avenue, a black 1999 Ford Ranger pickup with plate FSL 878, and uh, residence at 15 or at 1353 Staubach Circle, Anchorage, Alaska. And some of these search warrants, like the one on the Ford Ranger and the one on the defendant's residence at Staubach Circle, those don't actually end up getting served until October 8th. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so the police department has them in hand and can serve them later. Um, but I want to talk specifically about the AT&T records. Why do you all get AT&T records? Because uh, global positioning, tower logs, uh, the uh, cellular data from the, uh, the cellular companies provides uh, kind of geopositional data so we can locate the phone and see where the, the uh, person that keeps that phone with them is most likely. And in your experience, is AT&T generally pretty quick about providing those records? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And in this case, once they were received by the APD, um, who did you all turn them over to or a copy of them over to? I believe we turned those over to Mr. Perry with uh, with the uh, the task force. The, with the FBI task yes. force? Yes, ma'am. And is he somebody you all work frequently with? Yes, from time to time. Okay. Um, was the search warrant on the town place Marriott served immediately? I believe it was. And do you know who who was the in charge of the that crime scene team that did that? I would have to let me look at my report here. If it'll refresh your recollection, go ahead and look at page one of your report. Forget to have these glasses. Sergeant Fisher of the uh, major crime scene uh, team. Okay. And is she now a lieutenant? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then after that, on October 2nd, you apply for what's called a ping warrant. Yes, ma'am. Okay. How is a ping warrant different than like the historical cell, cell data that you were getting in the first AT&T warrant? It provides real-time information every 15 minutes. It provides a location data for where that phone is so that we can uh, kind of track a subject or determine where they are and where they're going, where they've been. And was it based on that information that you all learned that Mr. Smith was out of town on the second? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, in addition, and then additional planning goes into effect that I think Detective Lee can can talk about. On October 6th, did you apply for additional records from AP or AT&T? Yes, ma'am. Tell the jury about that, please. Well, on the 6th, I applied for the Google search warrant, which encompassed the account data and the IMEI. That was search warrant 3370. And were you associating it with a particular, were particular phone numbers in particular? Um, Email addresses? Yes, ma'am. What were those phone numbers and email addresses? 907-205-6883. And the uh, IMEI number is 310-410-1558. Uh, and then what was the um, email address that you asked Google for? Oh, Brian Smith, AK at gmail.com. And like the previous AT&T data, was that also turned over to Agent Perry? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it was also forwarded to Agent Elliot Peterson. I think both of them. And it was Elliot Peterson, an FBI agent that had some specialty in IT, let's just say generally. Yes, ma'am. I want to talk to you about the 7th. On October 7th, did you apply for another series of search warrants? Yes, I did. Tell the jury about that, please. 
Where did you apply for? Uh, Spring Hill Suites by Marriott University Lake, which was uh, 4050 University Lake. Did for, you, was that um, because that was where Mr. Smith worked? Yes, ma'am. It was for Brian Smith's office area and any secured storage areas. Okay. So not the whole hotel, but just like where he would be working. That's correct. Okay. And then um, after that, where else? Uh, First National Bank, South Center, 201 West 36th Avenue. And what were you searching there? For a joint safety deposit box that was in Smith and Bislin's name. And then did you get um, sub, did you get additional warrants for his residence in the Ford Ranger? Yes, ma'am, I did. Okay. And then after that, do you have some, do you go back and amend some of the search warrants on the 8th that you had previously gotten? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Tell the jury about that. Why did you amend your search warrants? Initially, uh, Ms. Kassler reported that she had found the SD card. Um, I believe she said it was in the street. But then later on, after we talked with her, she admitted that she had taken the, uh, the SD card, basically stolen it, taken it from uh, the vehicle. So we had to do what was called a curative search warrant. And that was new to me too. And the way that works is you take the probable cause from your initial search warrant, but you don't tell the judge some of the circumstances to confirm that he would grant you the probable cause to search that card, even though the context around how the, the card was obtained had changed. So when before Judge Loeb, Judge Loeb, mm -hmm and uh, provided him with the information he granted the search warrant and then i told him that there was more to it i had the da there with me and then i went on record provided the additional information and that that kind of cured the uh the way that we'd initially searched it was a good faith search you know thinking this was found property but the circumstances changed a little bit so we had to do that you want the court to be aware that the card was stolen and not found and make sure that you still had probable cause to search those places. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And do it despite um, that difference that it, the card had been stolen from the vehicle as opposed to found on the street where you still granted those search warrants. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And um, were you, and which warrants did you cure in that process? So he issued uh, 3AM-19-3382, uh, and then the... Uh, and then just the general locations, and that was yes. for, and then the general locations and items that were also cured. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Black 99 Ford Ranger pickup, uh, the Sw Spring Hill Suites uh, by Marriott University, 4050 uh, University Lake. Uh, First National Bank, South Center, 1353 Staubach Circle, person of Brian Smith, and the uh, digital evidence seized under multiple search warrants. Um, on the 8th, were there a lot of a lot of moving parts at APD on the 8th? Yes, ma'am. What was going on? Uh, when Mr. Smith was coming back to town, we had to uh, facilitate an interview with him. We also uh, had some additional items to search. He brought his suitcase with him. And so I was tasked with uh, this kind of support position to get in search warrants while they did those things. Okay. Did you get um, search warrants for his luggage? Yes, ma'am. Search warrants um, to seize the property off of him at the time? Yes. Okay. And then um, while investigators were at his home on Staubach Circle were there firearms that were located? Yes. Had the, had the seizing of firearms been on your original search warrant? No, ma'am. Why not? Because it was a uh, strangulation case that we were initially investigating and not a shooting. Okay. Did that change after investigators talked at length to Mr. Smith? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
And so then you've got a team of folks at the residence and they see firearms. What do you do to be able to seize those? Right under the search warrant. So you got court's authority to seize firearms at the residence? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, did the name Ian Calhoun become important in the investigation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. On October 14th, or I'm sorry, on October 23rd, did you attain, obtain some additional search warrants relative to that gentleman? Uh, yes, ma'am. Tell me about that. I obtained a uh, Facebook uh, search warrant for uh, username eon.calhoun.1. Okay. Uh, AT&T National Compliance Center uh, account records for 907-390-7035. And was that the phone number associated with Mr. Calhoun? I believe so, yes. Okay. And then, and not then anything else from him? Apple iPhone 8 belonging to Ian Calhoun. And then did you also apply, while investigators were at the residence and seizing electronics, um, did you apply for an additional search warrant to look into those electronics? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, did that also happen on the 23rd? Yes, um, 19-3570. Okay. That's all the questions I have for you, except for all of these warrants that you get. Um, does the Anchorage Police Department have a crime scene team? Yes, ma'am. Tell the jury about that crime scene team and how they work in conjunction with the, the detectives. The crime scene team, the major crime scene response team, uh, used to be called the homicide response team. And is it, it's a team that is uh, specifically tasked with uh, processing high-level crime scenes, which are typically homicide scenes. It's uh, composed of a team leader and five uh, team members. The uh, team leader kind of orchestrates things, of course. And then the other tasks are doled out, which include uh, photographs, many, many photographs of everything in there, a videographer that goes through and videos the scene, a diagrammer that goes through and measures and makes as best a scale diagram as, as they can of the uh, the scene. We also uh, had a Leica scanner at that time, which was a, a digital scanner that scanned the scene. And then we have another uh, team member that goes through just with a recorder and uh, just describes everything that they observe in the finest detail they can. And uh, that's how the team processes each of these crime scenes. And then they put a report together for the uh, for the investigators. Do they collect and preserve evidence as well? They do a lot of that too. Okay. And is there good communication back and forth between crime scene team and the investigators? Yes, we try to facilitate that best we can. Okay. And so each of these warrants that you obtained, you would then turn over to somebody at crime scene and say, I've got the warrant, you're free to search yes, the residence now. I've got the warrant, you're free to search the truck now, et cetera. Yes, ma'am. Okay, but you didn't, weren't actually responsible for any of the searching. I, the I wasn't searching, I was there serving. I was uh, just drafting and obtaining the warrants. Okay, and I think we're gonna get into some crime scene stuff over the next few days, but is um, Detective Sean Davies in the hallway? Yes, ma'am. Was he a member of the crime scene team at that time? Yes. So you remain a member of the crime scene team? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's all the questions I have for you. No problem, sir. You're Right here next to me, please, sir. Watch out for the screen as you go by. <clears throat> Remain standing, raise your right hand, and we'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony will give in this case now before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Please state your hand. <clears throat> 
It's Detective Sean Davies, S H A W N, last name D A V I E S. Detective, can you introduce yourself to the jury? Tell them who you are and where you work. Uh, I'm Detective Sean Davies. I work for the Anchorage Police Department. My current assignment uh, is to the Crimes Against Children Unit within the Anchorage Police Department. Um, I've been with the department 17 years. Um, in addition to my duties uh, as a detective in that unit, I'm also a member of the crime scene team. Okay. And, and the jury just heard a little bit from Sergeant Baker about what the crime scene team is, but um, how long, so you say in additional to your regular duties, you're by day, crimes against children detective. Correct. Um, how does the crime scene call out happen? How are you part of that team? Uh, so the crime scene call out happens uh, as a member of the team. It's a specialty team within the Anchorage Police Department. We consist of right at, at a full staff, 18 members. Um, there are three teams consisting of six members on each team. Um, we work uh, to uh, collect evidence and process scenes for major instances. Most often it is death investigations, homicides, or robbery assaults. Um, we are contacted by the uh, homicide unit uh, to respond, uh, to process that, to collect evidence, um, and document the scene. Okay. And how long have you been on the crime scene team? Since February of 2017. Okay. So um, is that six years? or five uh, it's february 2024 seven years right when did you start 2017 okay seven years yeah. um so, so you've been doing that for seven years do you have a, a leadership role on that team now i do my current um position within the team is within the team that i am on i am the team lead okay so you're the team leader for your group of six correct and how often is your group of six on call uh we used to operate with a month on, two months off schedule. Um, now we operate with a two weeks on, four weeks off. So within every six week period, um, my team is on call for two of those weeks currently. Um, however, within the team, when other team members need coverage or another team lead needs assistance, then um, we are able to switch in and out with other teams to assist. Can you tell the jury a little bit about the um, training you received to be a member of that team? Uh, so in addition to the training I received while as a patrol officer through um, uniformed investigations, which is processing scenes, taking photographs, collecting evidence, um, since I've been a member of the crime scene team, I've received additional training in things like uh, bloodstain pattern analysis, shooting incident reconstruction, um, the use of chemicals on crime scenes to process uh, a scene or evidence. Um, crime scene photography. In addition, in January of 2023, I went to a 10 week training through the University of Tennessee, uh, known as uh, commonly referred to as the body farm, but it is the National Forensics Academy. Um, during that 10 weeks, there are week long blocks of uh, photography, use of chemicals, diagramming and mapping. Um, shooting reconstruction, bloodstain pattern analysis, uh, as well as several other subject matter um, courses that have to deal with crime scene to include um, body recovery um, from grave sites and uh, etymology, which is the, the kind of analysis of insects with bodies. And having done that work as long as you have seven years, um, how many major crime scenes do you think you've responded to? If you were month on, two off for a while, and then more recently, two on, four off? Uh, I would estimate, I don't have an exact number, I would estimate as of now between 85 to 100. Crime scenes that you've processed from beginning to end? Crime scenes related to crime scene um, specific callouts. Um, additionally, as a patrol officer um, and in my current duties, additional processing of crime scenes. Sure, um, but 85. I think you said 85 to 100 call outs. Correct. Okay. And um, so I want to get to 2019. In October of 2019, was it the month on, two months off situation? It was. Okay. And did you actually respond to a number of scenes involving Brian Smith? I did. Okay. I'm going to start with October 2nd of 2019. Um, what did you do on that day? What was the nature of your response? 
the nature of my response, so I was contacted by the team lead at that time, now retired Sergeant Mark Bakken. Um, shortly after 10 o'clock, uh, I responded and met another crime scene team member where we keep um, our large van that we take to scenes to process. Um, we responded to mile 108 of the Seward Highway um, and went to that location. My primary assigned role for the processing of that scene was sketch diagram. Um, and so I completed a diagram for that scene and then assisted other crime scene team members as needed. Okay. And who was um, who was responsible for photographing that scene? Uh, Sergeant uh, Amanda Fisher, um, who's now promoted to lieutenant. Okay. And are you expecting her to testify a little later this afternoon? I am. Okay. And just um, even though she took the photographs, were you there and, and viewed everything that, that she photographed? I was. Okay. And um, who else was part of that team that day? You, you talked about Sergeant Bakken was the lead. Now Lieutenant Amanda Fisher was there. Um, who else was there? Uh, Detective Bart Filipovich was there. And then um, we also requested the additional assent, uh, assistance of the technical support unit to, since it was an outdoor scene for the use of drones. And you said you did diagramming, is that correct? Correct. I'm going to approach with what I've marked for identification as States Exhibit 116. Um, and we can take it out of the page. But um, what is States Exhibit 116? Uh, it is the three pages of data that I collected uh, and measurements that I collected for the sketch diagram that notes uh, the sketch uh, sheet as page one. Uh, with placard markings and measurements. Uh, page two are notations of reference points and uh, three of the placarded items of GPS location. And page three is uh, a reference sheet that I use to mark and measure for the measurements of placard locations one and two. Is that a true and accurate copy of the diagram that you made on scene that day? It is. Okay. And when you're doing those measurements, um, did anybody assist you in doing those? Uh, Detective Filipovich did. Okay. And I'd move at this point for the admission of 116. Okay. It's admitted. I'm also going to approach with what's been marked for identification as states exhibits 54 through 89. Go ahead and take a look at those quickly. I think that they are front and back, if I'm not mistaken. Are those photos that were taken on scene that day? They are. Were they taken by now Lieutenant Fisher? They were. Okay. Do they fairly and accurately depict the scene at mile 108.5 as you saw it on that day? They do. I'd move at this point for the admission of States Exhibit 54 through 89. Uh, I have a... Oh, oh I'm sorry. These are... I, I'm I sorry, Judge. Numbers. These are 90 through 115. That's Well, I've thing. got the other ones you referenced as well, but it, it's a bigger I, set. I apologize. These are 90 through 115. That 90 through 115 are the mile 108. And then the same packet has 116. Yep. That same packet, Judge, I haven't given him 54 through 90 yet. Those are the Marriott. Yeah, We're going to get to those I later. Had two packets clipped together. Correct. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. No for objection. Question. They're admitted. Okay. And this. To be clear for the record, these are, that was my error, exhibits 90 through 115, correct? Uh, yes, those are the ones I have. Um, I'd move at this point for the admission and publication of those, Judge? Yeah, I, okay. that's what I've already admitted. They're admitted, you may publish. Okay, and publish means I'm going to show them on the TV behind you. Detective Davies, can you do me a favor and angle that TV towards the jurors? We're angling it back and forth so that the jurors' images aren't caught in any glare by cameras. Um, there was some, some information that the TV might be picking up when it's in a Tell me how far you want. That's good. That's okay. Good.
Okay. States Exhibit 90, you talked about um, the crime scene team van. Is is that a van or is it motorhome or you call it a van, but what is it? I call it a van. Uh, it, I'm not 100% on classifications of motorhomes, but it is a uh, class A motorhome. So it's large, big, white, bus-like looking um, vehicle. Has it been retrofitted to serve APD's purposes? Uh, yes, it has some additional equipment not only attached to the outside, you can see on top of this fan, it's uh, a night scan. And so that is a light that's controlled uh, with a remote control that's down uh, at ground level. And we're able to utilize that light in dark situations to illuminate scenes uh, that we might need to in outdoor uh, conditions. And where is the, the van located at this point? At this point, there's a pullout at mile 108. So it is parked uh, in that location just on the north side of the pullout. So on the Seward Highway at mile 108, if you're looking at this, you see the lanes of the road. That's like if you're traveling into Anchorage. So it would be considered like inbound to Anchorage or traveling north. Um, and this is on the north end of that pullout. Uh, the railroad tracks are over off to the side, kind of over the bluff. Um, and then further in front of the van uh, or motorhome, there were uh, other patrol vehicles. Okay. Now, if you were to orient this van right now to where the remains are found, um, can you see an embankment on the left? You can. Um, so oriented to kind of where the remains were found. The remains are actually found kind of off this forward, just forward and down over this embankment down where the railroad track are. And we'll get the, some photos closer up of that. What is 91? So routinely what we do when we're at a crime scene in an outdoor situation allows us to do it. We take photographs um, from an elevated position, in this case, on top of the crime scene van, if it's you know in conditions that are safe enough to do so. So um, what you originally saw was a previously in exhibit 90 was a photograph in the facing the north direction. There'll be a series of photographs taken in a counterclockwise direction. And so this is a, an additional photograph, shows the overall condition, shows a different perspective going over to the railroad tracks into the bluff. Um, you can kind of see that night scan in the bottom corner there that orients that uh, uh, Lieutenant Fisher was just simply moving uh, in that counterclockwise direction to capture the area in totality. What is 92? Um, Sorry, I'm trying to get to uh, So 92 um, is same from that same orientation on top of the crime scene van. You doesn't capture any part of the van, but now it is facing out towards the Cook Inlet. Um, over the area of that bluff down to the railroad track, um, facing away from the roadway uh, down to show kind of that overall perspective of the railroad. 93. Again, continuing in that counterclockwise direction, um, showing that area and location where uh, the, there's a railroad truck, um, showing that and continuing on and showing Cook Inlet, that perspective over the the edge of the bluff. Um, and now we're getting into that area where it's consistent where the area where the skeletal remains were found over the bluff through that vegetation, it, for the view through that visit, visit, uh, vegetation. Okay, so that truck belongs to the railroad, not to, not to the APD? Correct. Okay, there's a couple of gentlemen in the far left-hand side behind the van. Um, that's me standing there, and that's uh, Detective Filipovich. 94. Again, so now uh, Lieutenant Fisher is now facing in the southward direction. You see the patrol vehicles that are parked uh, to the south of the crime scene van uh, in the pullout at mile 108, um, continuing to show that perspective of uh, just the overall conditions uh, from an elevated position. Uh, again, myself and Detective Filipovich are there. Uh, the person just forward of us is Officer Damon Jackson, who is there to assist uh, with drone video and photographs, as well as uh, mapping using the drone. Um, and then this person here is Officer Busby, who was there for scene security. 
Okay. And when you talk about scene security, at the point APD gets there, is this place on complete lockdown, like nobody is allowed to go to and from, et cetera? Correct. We manage the area. Um, routinely, it's done with a, someone with the a patrol division to manage it. And as shifts rotate, we will continue to rotate people there when we're on a crime scene just to maintain uh, scene security and scene integrity while we are conducting uh, the actual collection of evidence and other um, tasks that we have to do at that location. Okay. And the heavy equipment vehicle that you can see down there, is uh, that railroad equipment? It is. What is 95? So 95 is a uh, still, again, a photograph taken from the crime scene van from an elevated position. You can see kind of the down at the bottom of this, you can see the edge of the van, and then you can see the guardrail over this area that is photographed that has the vegetation and the trees. That is the approximate location where uh, the skeletal remains were found uh, down by the railroad, but this is a perspective from the crime scene van looking down at that area uh, and the vegetation blocking the view. How steep is that embankment? Uh, it's fairly steep. Um, it's, it's steep enough that we had to watch our footing as we went up and down from that location. Um, I don't believe we recorded like the actual grade, um, but it is, it is steep enough that um, we wanted to ensure our own safety when traveling up and down. Is there a, a small, I don't want to call it a footpath, but a, a cleared area sort of on the far right of the picture? Correct. There is kind of like a, I mean, I, I don't necessarily know if it was created as a footpath, but there is an opening in the vegetation that allows us uh, to utilize that for going up and down the hill kind of through this uh, area here, um, which was near uh, an area of here is a tarp uh, that was located. Um, and later photographed and collected as evidence as well. 96. Again, I just referenced what was seen from that elevated position on the crime scene van of that tarp. Um, so now this is a photograph at ground level of that tarp, um, able to see the positioning of the tarp as well as the foliage on top of it. Um, and then there's an area of here that was identified as hair and that was collected as evidence as well. 97 is so in crime scene when we do photos and with any sort of police investigation that we we do we teach uh I, we practice it and then we teach it as well when people are coming to the academy to not just walk up to something take a picture so we take pictures from essentially general to specific showing its placement within a scene and then continuing on and taking a series of photographs to show the specific details of those things this is that tarp um, there's someone's hand up there, so obviously that tarp is in the process of being collected. However, as it's being collected, being moved within its placarded location, a series of photographs are taken uh, to show its condition at the time of its collection. Okay, so you take overall photographs, you put placards down, take new photographs with placards. Correct. If, so, we, if we were to show the jury every photograph crime scene team took, how many do you think it is? I would say routinely in crime scenes, we take hundreds of photographs uh, to capture things from different perspectives or from different views. Um, we do, we take overall photographs when we arrive on scene. We assess the scene as we're taking these overall photographs. Then we go back, placard those items, take additional photographs with those placarded items. And that process continues all the way through the point of collection. Um, I've taken hundreds of photos on, on crime scenes, as well as how several times I've taken more than a thousand photographs. Okay. And so this um, tarp that's at placard five, that's where you showed us up near the top of that embankment, was that um, collected and taken into evidence? It was, uh, the, specifically the tarp itself was marked as placard location three. Uh, placard location five, there was a hypodermic needle that was seen um, and we collected that as well. Um, and so then around the area of the tarp, we collected pieces of evidence as we collected it, um, noting its condition and the items around it. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, um, 98. Again, series of photographs. Uh, this is one of those taken of that tarp. You saw in the previous exhibit 97 that there was attached uh, braided rope. Um, and so then this is just that, that that item, the tarp has been moved to allow for 
uh, continued documentation of specifically that rope attached to the tarp. 99. So 99 is taken um, down on the railroad. So now off of the embankment, you can see kind of that incline in the rocky conditions, right? At times there's, you know, kind of rock base that wouldn't allow access. So we've accessed it. Um, and now we're on a railroad. The, the photograph is oriented to project south. So like kind of going out of town, leaving Anchorage, um, you see the, the kind of configuration of the railroad. There's a person down there that's uh, Detective Filipovich. He is collecting video of the scene. So he's, in addition to the photographs, we also conduct a walkthrough video of all the items. And so he's doing that uh, down where there's the area of skeletal remains. Um, and we'll progress through a series of photographs continuing to that location. One thing to note, well, I'll continue in my explanation of these photographs is this post here, uh, kind of with that reflective bar um, as a guide, kind of where, that, where the items are, where Detective uh, Filipovich is taking that video recording. Okay. So is he in the general location of the remains at that there? He is. Okay. So between him and the bar, essentially? Correct. Or him and the post? Yes. And 100? Uh, so again, a continuation. Uh, Lieutenant Fisher is continuing in that south direction as taking photographs from that general to specific as she continues to move in a south direction towards the remains. Um, there's kind of some boulders. You can kind of make out uh, kind of that overall position where Detective Filipovich was standing as he was uh, collecting um, the video recording for this. 101. Again, kind of continuing in that southward direction along the railroad. Um, as you approach the skeletal remains, uh, the, there's a board here. Um, it's like a weathered particle board. Um, it's warped and stained from outdoor exposure. Here in the middle, there is, it's easier for me to use a pen. It's uh, a bone fragment that was on top of that uh, particle board. And then just past, if you continue past, there's a kind of this flat rock, and now you're starting to see the outline and the shape of the remains that were found. 102. Um, again, continuing in that southward direction along the railroad tracks, down here in the lower left corner is that board that I referred to. As you continue south past, now you're able to see where that uh, post is with the reflective tape, as well as the skeletal remains. Um, positioned along the railroad tracks. 103. So close up view, or at least an overall general view of that area showing the, the skeletal remains, showing you can make out the shape, you can make out um, the legs and the features, as well as the pelvis and head, rib bones. Um, you can see the exposed mandible um, and the position in the way that the the remains were found um, when we arrived. Okay, and I want to talk to you just a little bit about that. Um, can remains decompose very quickly? They can. Okay. Does that depend on the amount of predation, the weather, etc.? Objection yeah. to bleeding and um, your approach, Judge. Objection sustained. What are the factors that might influence how quickly a body decomposes? Objection. Overruled. Uh, so things that to consider when um, you're evaluating decomposition would be uh, weather conditions, um, the atmospheric conditions, whether it be temperature or um, rain, um, including and to include also insect activity, uh, predation. Um, so any effects that some sort of animal would put place on the body. Um, it's also, it's um, if it's protected, like how it's stored essentially, whether it's covered or not covered or just exposed to the elements themselves. Okay. Um, and is that something you understand the medical examiner to have specific training on as well? I do. Were you shocked when you saw these remains? No. Relevance. What is the relevance? Just the the time, what, given the time frame that this wasn't out of out of the ordinary. Overruled. And maybe your approach on that, Judge. Yes. Question was basically, were you surprised given the time frame when you saw these remains? 
I was not. Okay. And going to 104, what is that to pick? Uh, 104 is just a photograph taken with a different perspective, uh, noting the area at the bottom of the embankment um, of the remains, uh, noting its overall uh, positioning of its features uh, with the kind of bent at the area of the pelvis, um, the positioning of the feet. Um, routinely what we do is we don't walk up to something, just take a photograph from one perspective. Um, so we take a series of photographs uh, to be able to capture the entire scene um, from multiple multiple points of view. 105. Again, this is what, what I would consider a specific, more specific photo of the overall area as well as the overall um, condition of the remains that were found, um, showing the position of the body, showing uh, exposed bones. There is um, the presence of some tissue um, and the overall decomposition of the body. 106. These are specific photographs um, of, the, of the showing the hands, the conditions of the hands, their positioning. Um, some of the fingers, uh, finger bones um, appear to be missing, um, as well as just kind of showing the overall remains or skeletal tissue and skin remaining attached to the arm. And the um, fingers being missing, is that consistent with animal predation? It is. It's um, in my training, um, that is commonly bones that are missing from animal predation are finger bones. 107. So 107 is basically a photograph that Lieutenant Fisher took kind of looking down upon the remains. Um, you can see uh, the, the skull. You can also see the attached mandible. Um, that it is, there's some absence of connective tissue or skin. Um, you also see the condition of the ribs, um, the spine and the pelvis and the leg. Okay, and when you say mandible, the jaw with the teeth in it? Uh, correct, the jaw bone right here uh, with the, the attached teeth. 108. 108 is just a, what I consider a specific photograph of the rib cage area um, and the positioning, uh, noting um, again, the jawbone, the location, the presence of teeth, as well as the overall positioning of the body. Okay, and can you point to that jawbone? Uh, yeah, so the jawbone is right here. You can see uh, teeth located in the, on the bottom part of the jawbone. And under here, you can also see, uh, because of the positioning of the teeth, you can see the bottoms of the teeth. These are teeth that are located on the top um, of the mouth. And 109. Again, um, taking those photographs from different perspectives, we've seen photographs from looking down, we've seen photographs from the left and the right, and this is a photograph now on the, the ledge or the hillside, looking back to show um, the condition of the remains uh, from the spine and the, the decomposition. And 110? Uh, 110, again, is overall uh, a photograph um, what is going to, for my review of the photos that we're going to look at, is going to show in continuation with 111 the perspective and the relationship of that piece of plywood and that bone fragment that's on top. So we have the body uh, located on the right of the screen. Um, its position hasn't been moved. It's just been continued to be photographed. And as we continue, kind of there'll be, you can use rocks as like the reference to show that relative space with the next uh, photograph to show its position with the board. And so there's that rock I was just kind of referencing that had that can next to it and kind of the overall span um, from the board to the bone fragment. And that's in 111? In 111, yeah, there's the, the particle board that's gray and weathered and then the bone fragment is located right there. And when you say particle board, is that a fairly light piece of wood? Uh, it can be a light piece of wood. I don't recall like the weight specifically about that board itself, but um, it's basically the press board that you see in home construction with um, the laminate that holds pieces of wood together to form a sheet of plywood. And um, is this typically a fairly windy area? It is. 112 is a uh, specific over a photograph of that bone fragment that's sitting on top of the particle board. 113. 
and I would say this is like the most specific photograph that we would take in here. There's a pen. Um, the pen wasn't part of the scene, um, but I can say that routinely we don't have like a scale on hand with us when we're taking photographs, we will put a known item there. So in case this known item isn't touching the item, but that pen shows reference to the relative size of that bone fragment. And 114. So like we talked about before, um, we routinely take, we take those pictures, then we placard items. So we've taken pictures of the bone fragment before. Um, it's placarded. Now we have introduced placards into the scene. So we are going to show our placement of the placard and um, take a photograph showing that location. 115. And in this case, same concept. We took photographs of the skeletal remains before. We then marked it with a placard. In this case, they were marked as placard location one. Okay. And we've previously looked at your diagram. That's 116. But I wanted to show that for the jury. Can you show the jury where, where those placards are relative to one another? Yeah. So on this um, scene, I used a reference point, which was um, determined to be a switch that is always going to be in place at the railroad place. I made measurements um, around to capture the scene so we could um, know location, but placard location one for the remains is here, and then placard location for the bone fragment there is number two. Okay, and then the items up the embankment, where are those? Those are here, uh, just kind of noted for their relative position of uh, placards three, four, and five. Um, and that would be, there's that kind of pull off parking lot at mile 108. This would be the guardrail along there. And then these are just on the other side of the guardrail. What really isn't shown from that kind of downward perspective of the sketch diagram is the actual slope and grade um, from that. And we were able to use, um, utilize that drone footage that was able to do mapping and collect video and photographs for capturing kind of the overall totality of that grade that goes down to the railroad. Okay. And um, to remind the jury, placards three, four, and five are what? Uh, so placard three is the tarp that we had previously seen. There was additionally, there were some items collected around that tarp that were at that location. Um, there was a, several items. We collected a, a, um, a soil sample from that location as well. Placard five was a hypodermic needle that was located at that location. And placard three, or I'm sorry, placard four, uh, was a steel reserve uh, beer can that was there close to the area of the tarp. Um, and in addition, there's one more number on there, number six. Uh, that was an area that uh, Sergeant Bakken identified, had some trash, had a couple um, like nitrile gloves, like the gloves we wear similar to like latex gloves. And those were located at placard location six and we collected items there as well. Okay, and you discussed hair that was found up by that tarp? Correct. They're, so that would have been at placard location three. Okay. And then are those things to some degree noted on page three of three? They are. One and two. Uh, so three of three notes my loc my uh, use of the reference point, which was I was informed by the railroad personnel that they call that the north derail switch at Rainbow. So I use that as my reference point for making measurements. Um, and then the measurements in cardinal directions, in this case, north and east, uh, are those locations for placard location one, which was the body or the remains, and placard location two, which was the fragment atop the plywood board. And those are all the questions I have about this scene. I want to move on to some other scenes that you have assisted in processing. And um, specifically, can we go to October 3rd? 2019. So after this call on October October 2nd, um, were you also part of a crime scene team call out at the Town Place Suites Marriott? I was. Okay. And tell the jury your role in that scene. Um, on that day, I was contacted to respond to the, that hotel location. Uh, my primary duties for that scene were to take photographs uh, and collect a video recording. Okay. And you've already kind of described the roles. The video is going through from beginning to end what's in the room. And the photos are just like we saw here of Lieutenant Fisher's taking the photographs. 
at the hotel scene. I took the photographs, but similar to what Lieutenant Fisher did at the uh, mile 108 scene. Okay. And who else was present in the seat, um, search of the town place Marriott? Uh, was Officer Sitz, uh, Lieutenant Fisher, and myself. Okay. And did you have a warrant to search there? We did. Okay. And um, were you also given permission to be there by the hotel management? Uh, they had been contacted and they provided us an access key to the apartment or to the hotel room. I am going to show you what has been marked and provided to the court and council as now states exhibit 54 through 89. Go ahead and take a look at those briefly they're front and back our um, 54 through 89 photographs that you took at the Town Place Suite Marriott on October 3rd, 2019. They are. And to be specific, are they all of room 323? They are. Do they fairly and accurately depict that room as you saw it that night? Yes, they do. I'd move at this point for the admission of state's exhibits. Is it 54 through 90? Through 89. 54 through 89. Objection. They're admitted. And um, in photographing, we kind of talked about like the idea that you might take a lot more photographs than the jury ends up seeing. Did you take 199 photos of the of this? I did. Okay. And when you were there at the Town Place Suites Marriott, um, do you know if Mr. Smith was alleged to be the last person in that room or something else? The understanding that we had was that there had been other guests who had rented that room um, and had stayed there since um, since uh, his presence there. Okay. And did management actually ask a current guest to move to a different room? Yes. Okay. So the jury's going to see photos of a bed unmade. Um, is it your understanding that it had been cleaned several times between Mr. Smith's stay and, and the time you're there? Uh, yes, that's my understanding. And then items that were left behind by the tenant who was asked to move, such as like trash or the room had not been cleaned once that tenant had left the room. Okay. So once APD is there, the hotel doesn't go in and start doing cleaning. So it's as is from the tenant that was there on the third. Is that, is that does that make sense? Correct. Yes. Okay. So let's start with 54. What is 54? Again, kind of that concept that we're going to take photographs as we go into a scene to document. This is just a scene, a photograph from the hallway, noting that we are specifically there. The door is closed, but specifically for room 323. 55. So it's an up-close photograph of the actual placard of that room. 56. So as you enter, so the previous uh, photographs were from outside. They showed the door. They showed the actual placard for room that room, specific room. Now I've opened the door. You can see that the door is here on the left and being propped open. Um, so this is the view into the room. You see uh, kind of it's, it's a corridor that goes in. It has a kitchen area as well as these double door closets, has like a linen closet. And then you see, so there's this kitchen area looking out into what I would consider like the living room area of the room. Um, you see the furniture within that living room area, you see the, the different types of flooring. So there's a transition from the, the kitchen area with kind of that plank laminate type flooring that transitions into the carpet, which is in the living room and bedroom area. Um, and it's just one set of photographs that were captured in the progression into that room. And 57. Again, just that continued perspective, taking photographs from different angles. You can still see the door is propped open showing the kitchenette area um, with the appliances um, and capturing partial view of the, the living room area. 58. So now I am within the actual um, hotel room itself. I've now basically turned 180 degrees to take a photo back at the door that was being propped up. So this is the entry door to the room. 
um, capturing the rest of the kitchen area. You can see the appliance that we previously saw, the refrigerator, but I'm now looking back uh, towards the, the door that accesses the hotel room. Okay, so you're like standing in the transition between the living area and the kitchen area? Yeah, essentially I'm, I'm kind of on outside the swing of the door and then looking back at the entry door in the vicinity of the general area and that transition to where we where I pointed out before that transition between the, the two types of flooring within the room. And what is 59? So now I'm standing in that kind of threshold area again, but not turned back into the living room area, noting the location of furniture, the kind of office desk, the couch, um, the window. You can actually probably make out my reflection in the window um, taking that photograph. Um, but just continuing in that progression that we're going to capture the scene as we enter um, in its entirety. 60. Um, I've just moved slightly into the room, taking a photograph specifically of the couch that's in the corner, um, noting, you know, partial view of the desk. There's a trash can down here, which appears to have some sort of contents in it. Um, but as, and then the, these photographs will then will progress um, in my sequence uh, through a, the entirety of the room. And, you know, not to beat a dead horse, but you don't have any expectation that the trash in that um, in that room was left by Mr. Smith, given the length of time. No, I had, I had no expectation. Of that. 61. Again, specific, just showing the presence of that trash can. Um, I mean, the, the trash that was there, there was um, a pizza box that we found in there, beer cans, all things that I would expect a the hotel staff to have cleaned between occupancy within the room. Okay. And now the um, desk behind you is that directly op or the desk in front of you is that directly opposite a bed behind you? Correct. So I'm facing. So we upon entry. So I'm facing the wall, looking at the desk, taking the photograph of that. Directly to my back is the the main bed. There's only one bed within the the room. Um, I guess I'll rephrase. There's one bed that's exposed for sleeping. This couch was actually later found to be a pullout couch. And so it actually has a mattress within it, um, but not in the pulled out position for this photograph. C2. Underneath the kind of office working desk, there was a, another desk or a, a table that extended and was able to be pulled out. So I just pulled that out to, to capture what the condition of the top of that surface was. 63. Uh, it's just an overall view of the couch that was located uh, along that wall opposite of we did. Um, we're making an assessment for things that were there. Um, notes the pillow arrangement. There is a sock uh, on the couch itself, um, but just notes the overall condition of the couch. 64. So this is that bed before um, that was to my back when I was taking photographs of the couch. Um, the bed is unmade, which, you know, given the fact that the tenant um, who had been there, the occupant who had been there had left and the room wasn't cleaned, um, we weren't surprised to see that the, the bed was unmade. Um, and then notes the locations of the, the nightstands to each side of the bed. 65. Uh, previously, we had seen that the, the condition of the room when we were in there, the shades were actually pushed to one side wanted to capture what those shades look like to, to document the entirety. So we actually moved them and pulled them ourselves so that I could take an overall photograph of uh, the shade type. Okay. And so this is what the room looks like with the shades closed. Correct. Got it. 66. Uh, again, foot of the bed off to the right of the screen. There's a kind of a foot rest and a little, you know, a table stand as well as the couch um, from that perspective. 67. Again, um, as you come through, so within the room, we're looking at the bed, we're looking at the, the nightstand that's on the south side or as you're facing the right um, of the bed. And then you see that transition into the single bathroom for the uh, hotel room. You see kind of the carpet area to the south of the bed, as well as the transition in noting that uh, the flooring in the bathroom is consistent in the same as the flooring in the kitchen. 68. Overall photograph of the condition of the bed, um, as well as its relative placement to the bathroom door. 
um, and its uh, placement with the nightstands to each side. 69. This is an overall photograph of that area of carpet to the south of the bed. So the bed is here. Cardinal direction is to the south. However, as you're facing the bed, it's the right as facing. Um, shows the carpet pattern, shows the location of a television stand, um, and that transition you can see where the entry to the bathroom is. 70. Again, just a, a different view, a different perspective showing the television stand. You can see the kind of the oriented location of the layout of the hotel room with the kitchen. Um, in perspective to where the entry to the bathroom is. Okay, and so you're standing basically at the foot of the bed to take this photograph? Uh, yeah, you can capture part of the bed right here. I'm just kind of at that foot um, noting so you can see both the entry to the bathroom as well as the access to the kitchen. 71. Just an overall photograph of the nightstand that's located to the south. Um, or right as facing, noting the television, things that were on top of the, the nightstand itself um, at that kind of entry to or near that entry to the bathroom. 72. This is the nightstand on the opposite side. So what would be considered the north or to the left side is facing um, and just showing its condition and placement within the hotel room. 73. So this is a photograph. I'm now on that north, north side of the bed. So you can see kind of that bed edge. I'm on that side with the, the nightstand, kind of with a perspective across the top of the bed and into the bathroom. 74. Just an overall photograph of the condition of the bathroom taken outside the bathroom. So outside that threshold of the bathroom, um, noting that perspective from, from the location the photo was taken. 75. Uh, this is just the open drawers of the television stand that's kind of on that wall between on the right side of this photograph, you can see the kitchen and on the left side, you can see the bathroom opened up the cabinets to capture the contents of the cabinets. There appears to be uh, like an extra blanket in a plastic covering. 76. Uh, as I mentioned before, we found that the couch was an actual pullout couch. Uh, so we took a series of photos to document its condition as well removed the cushions, pulled out the, the actual bed, um, took it, it, we found it had a sheet on top. So there's a photograph uh, with the protective sheet on top. 77. And just a follow-up photograph, we've you know disconnected that protective sheet, moved it to the top to note the conditions of the mattress itself. 78. So we're now outside, we're not in the room anymore. Um, our understanding and the information we were provided was that there was a the need to identify uh, a luggage um, cart uh, and to see if we could determine a specific luggage cart based on a sticker that was on one of the upright posts. And so these luggage carts were located in the entryway uh, to the main access to the uh, hotel. Was that because on one of the photographs that investigators had, there was a sticker on a post? Correct. And then is that sticker visible in States Exhibit 79? It is. As you're facing, I took this photograph, so it'd be this post right here that was against the wall, but it's uh, specific to that sticker. We were told kind of the shape of the sticker, the, you know, the approximate location where it was on the pole. Um, and so we were able, this is a series of photographs, again, taken. It was kind of overall, I captured both of the carts, and then there's a series of photographs to be more specific on that sticker itself. 80. This is that specific photograph of the sticker. Um, you know, not everything on the sticker itself is legible, but you can kind of make out the words Marriott and Suite. You can make out um, Anchorage. Uh, and then looks like appears you can make out the address, which was 600 East 32nd Avenue. Okay. And in the photos, investigators had um, all of that was pretty blurry, right? Correct. The placement, though, of the sticker was able to be determined from that. Um, this is just a specific photo when we located a corresponding sticker on that on the luggage uh, cart itself. So you're looking for placement size and shape, Correct. color. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what did you all do with these luggage with this luggage cart once you determined? Uh, so because of the size of it, what we ended up doing is you saw that it's kind of that arched in those metal pieces that go up. We actually used tools, disconnected that piece. The only piece we collected as a piece of evidence 
was this carpeted flat board on the bottom. Okay. And that was taken into evidence by the police department? It was. Okay. And 81? So 81 now back in the specific hotel room. Um, we have conducted a search of it. When we process crime scenes, we work from um, least intrusive to more intrusive. So we're not destroying evidence as we go. We don't just run right in there and go, ah, oh, there's a piece of evidence and we grab it or we might you know, cut into a wall or do those things. We're gonna do those things last. And so in this circumstance, we've already conducted a search of um, the room itself. So you see that we've moved the bed, you just see the metal frame, but you still see the, um, the placement of the nightstand that's to the north or to the left is facing, the entry to the bathroom. Um, and you see the, the television stand and kind of that transition into the kitchen. At this point though, the the, my camera is on a tripod, so I'm not freehanding, I'm not taking photographs. I have it in a stationary position. And so this photograph is taken prior to our administration of and use of Blue Star, which is a um, chemical we use to look for trace amounts of blood on, you can see on the television kind of nightstand, there's the actual applicator that we used. It's an aerosol can and the actual solution is mixed in the bottle down below. Now, tell the jury a little bit about Blue Star. Um, what is it? How does it work? So Blue Star is a chemical that's used to search for trace amounts of blood. Um, we, it, we put it in or areas that we might see or think that we've identified an area of blood or in areas where we don't see any blood, but there's the possibility that there could be a trace amount. And so what the chemical does is it uh, has a chemo, a chemo luminescent reaction with blood itself. Um, and so what we're able to do is turn off the lights, apply the blue star, and then allow it to react. And you'll see a, a chemical reaction of a, of a bright blue color that we're then able to capture and use to collect more evidence. Okay. Are there um, some other things that aren't blood that might show up as, as luminating or luminescent? There are, there are um, chemicals as well as there are some foods that will produce a chemical reaction. A reaction with Blue Star isn't necessarily um, mean that that's blood. It's considered a presumptive uh, reaction for blood. So when we see those reactions with the use of Blue Star, we are going to collect that and then allow for later testing with um, to be conducted on what we're seeing. Okay, and who makes those determinations about what um, testing is later conducted? Uh, that would be uh, the, the homicide unit or the investigators as well as the crime lab. Okay, so it's APD and the state crime lab in conjunction look at those things and say, what do we need in this case? What do we wanna test? Correct, our job as a crime scene team is simply to identify those things, identify those pieces of evidence, collect them so that those things can be done at a later time. Um, so what is 82? And if I could have Master Clerk, could you turn the lights down a little bit? And actually, we go back one slide for me. Yep. All right. So on this photograph, again, it's on a tripod. It's going to be stationary. I have changed the, the um, aperture and the exposure time for the, the camera, but I'm going to leave it here in our application of Blue Star. And so the, and we don't, can continue to use Blue Star over and over and over till we get that perfect shot, right? We want to identify those areas that are relevant and important and then collect them as evidence. So the tripod for the next two photographs after this will remain in the same place. Um, they'll kind of be a little different. They'll show a little bit of a different uh, blue reaction. But note that, that you'll see that white transition strip in the, in the kitchen. That'll become relevant because you'll be able to see that in one of the photographs to know that the camera remained in the same position. So going to exhibit 82, um, the camera has now um, been on a timed exposure. The aperture is open enough. Uh, two, but you're seeing that reaction that I talked about that you see with Blue Star, you're seeing that blue uh, chemiluescent uh, reaction to areas that are being sprayed. In this case, it's areas that are being sprayed on the carpet. You can kind of make out in this photograph, you can see kind of that white um, trim piece that's on the bottom. The next photograph in exhibit 83, that becomes more relevant. You can see the electrical outlet and there was additional application of Blue Star 
to capture um, the reactions that were on the carpet. And 84. This is just now, now the application of Blue Star has been done. Um, we took an additional photograph to show the area um, prior to our removal of an area of carpet at that location. And 85. 85 is uh, one of many exit photographs that we took. Um, it's again from that perspective of the kitchen area facing into the, the what was the living room. You can see that we've moved items. We've moved uh, the nightstand. We've taken the television off because we needed to to be able to get access to all the carpet underneath the television stand. Um, the bed frame and the bed are now moved, but you can see this is part of the area that was removed um of carpet that we collected as evidence and 86 again just overall exit photographs um at our end before we leave when we leave crime scenes we also document the condition in which we left them whether um, we do or don't um actually cut things away or collect things but we are going to document how we left the scene so you can see like this trash can is now empty. We photographed the trash contents. We've moved the bedding and we've moved items or furniture within um, to show how we left the room itself. 87. Again, just another perspective. I'm essentially standing where the bed used to be or at the foot of where the bed used to be. You can see the nightstands which are still in position against the wall. You can see the, the headboard that was attached to the wall. Um, in this case, this is the mattress, um, and it was supported by two kind of joining box springs that were supporting the mattress. 88. Uh, just another perspective uh, of the way the contents of the room were left when we left, um, noting the position of where we left furniture. You can capture a small area down here in the bottom corner uh, of the where we removed carpet. And 89. And this is just that overall specific area of where the carpet was removed um, relative to the area of the kitchen, <coughs> sorry, and the bathroom um, relative to where the television stand had been against that wall. And then the uh, nightstand that was to the south or to the left is facing um, of the bed. Okay. And um, after you left the Marriott, decisions about what of those things were tested um, were not yours to make. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, were you also involved, you know, this is part of being on crime scene team call out for a month at a time. Were you also involved in a search at Staubach Circle? I was. Okay. And what date and time did that occur? I believe it was October 8th. Okay. And um, was that a... I'm going to say a larger than normal response to a crime scene. Uh, it was. There were um, additional resources that were used, not only for um, initially going to the scene, but then additionally um, in assisting in processing the scene as well. Okay. And when you say additional resources, um, does the Cyber Crimes Unit come out to all of your searches? They, they do not come out to all of ours. Were they asked to come out with you in this case? They were. Okay. Um, who is um, Mark Thomas? Uh, he is a retired detective, but at the time he was a detective within the Cyber Crimes Unit at the Anchorage Police Department. Did he have a special role as a canine handler as well? He did. Okay. Did they bring a canine to that scene at any point? Um, my understanding is they brought o Odie. Um, he is a, I don't remember his exact title, but he is a, he was our lab that was trained to um, utilize scent to detect uh, items related to digital media. Um, so it was a unique response in that cyber crimes, in addition to the crime scene team also came in, did some searching? Correct. Okay, and what was your role there? Uh, my primary role at the address for that location was photographs. Um, I was there until what we refer to as being a timing out, the department sets limits on how many hours you can work within a 24 hour period. So I, that day's response, I'd already been basically at my normal day job doing that. Um, and then I responded for the, the efforts that were done there. I stayed at that location until my time was done with the primary role of taking photographs. And then once um, I met that time limit, then I left. Okay, and that time limit is after after midnight, so into October 9th? Correct. Okay. 
and while you were there, um, how many photographs did you take, do you recall? Over 400. And then who did you pass that responsibility off to? Uh, Officer Chelsea C. Okay. And I think the, the jury will hear from her next week. And so I, I'll probably skip through the Starbucks circle and let her testify to this time. Oh, we might get to her today looking at the time. So um, I think that that, is there any questions? Okay, but that's all the questions I have for you, Detective. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so you conducted, and it was part of your responsibilities in this case to conduct uh, multiple investigations of various scenes related to the alleged events underlying this case. I guess I responded to process the scenes as far as conducting the investigation that was done by the homicide unit. Well, you were, you were part of the investigation insofar as you collected evidence, right? Correct. And you decided what evidence to collect, right? I guess what evidence to collect wasn't always necessarily made by me specifically. There was a crime scene team lead for all of those scenes. I wasn't the lead for any of those scenes. Um, so that determination wasn't necessarily my choice, my decision. Okay. Were you involved in the decision making process? Uh, depending on what the circumstances were. Um, I didn't placard items. I was simply the guy who took the photographs. So, for example, you went to the, the Midtown Marriott part of this investigation right to room 323 correct and you helped process that scene i did and part of that was to decide what from that scene was going to be removed from the scene and brought back for further investigation right my role was to take photographs and collect video um the determination what evidence was going to be collected was made by um sergeant fisher and uh officer sits okay um for example you ended up your team ended up collecting part of the carpet from the scene right correct and that was after the application of blue star to that yes and you decided to do that because you or somebody else on the team decided that that would be relevant evidence to collect in the investigation of this case right correct and it was decided because when you went in you would determine that again at that time you you thought that the events underlying this case took place in room 323 right that is what the invest the homicide unit had determined. And it was determined a probable location within the room where the events on the video took place, right? That's my understanding, yes. Okay, well, you were there. You had no problem testifying to it on direct. That's what happened, right? That area was determined based on information that was obtained through the homicide unit, yes. And you were part of that process, right? I guess... Part of the process to make that determination, I never saw the video. I was simply informed this is the area that we are going to evaluate and collect evidence of. When you use the word process, I guess no one like said, hey, Sean, what do you think we should do here? I was the guy taking the photographs. Okay. And, and you were here testifying on direct about the process of, pro of processing that room. I'm sorry to use the same word with two different meanings, but you, I will rephrase it. You were there as part of the uh chain of events of processing that room right i was and you were here on direct we were all here talking about the processing of that room right yes and you testified on direct that blue star was deployed on a section of carpet right it was used yes and it was deployed on that section of carpet because it was suspected there may be blood there right that's my understanding yes you testified to on direct right there was Yes, that area was processed for the possibility that there were trace amounts of blood at that location. Right. And understanding it had been, by that point, a month since the alleged events, right? I don't recall. I wasn't told, like, what day the video was recorded. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I don't know if I could answer it being in a month, but okay. it you, had occurred at some point in the past. And you were aware that there, there had been other guests staying there since then? Correct. And there were guests there at the time, right? Correct. And that the hotel had engaged in its cleaning process, right? Correct. Had anybody asked the hotel what its cleaning process was? Not to my knowledge. So despite all that, it was still determined there may be trace amounts of blood that are relevant to this case. Yes. And that's why the Blue Star was deployed. Yes. And when the Blue Star was deployed, you did see some traces of blood or something else, but presumptive for blood, right? We saw the reaction, yes. 
and you testified on direct that, that could have been other things like other chemicals or foods, but you determined it was presumptive for blood, so you would collect it, right? I didn't. It, it the reaction is a presumptive test for blood, mm -hmm. and we collected it. And you collected it because the blood could be used for possible DNA analysis. Correct. And you collected, I think we saw from the last few photographs, you collected a large amount of carpet. So you were sure, your team was sure that you collected the section of carpet where that presumptive blood had been found. Correct. And despite the guess in between when the events underlying uh, or that are alleged to be underlying this case occurred and the time that you investigated, um, cleaning doesn't always get rid of blood or bodily fluids, right? That's why there's a potential for trace amounts of blood at that exactly. location. Right. And you also testify that you collect, uh, and I'm sorry, and I wanna clarify this. I believe you testify that your team collected the bottom of the luggage cart that was identified as possibly being relevant to this case. Correct. Uh, did not deploy, at least as far as I can tell, Blue Star on that. Correct. It was simply seized. Correct. And that was seized based on somebody's review of the video that determined that was likely the luggage cart that's alleged to have been used in this, in the events underlying this case. Correct. That's all I have, Judge. The presumptive test for blood, you weren't the lead investigator that like watched the video, right? Correct. You don't know if there was a large amount of blood, a small amount of blood, et cetera? I do not. You just looked and saw presumptive blood and collected? Correct. And left it up to these guys to determine what was tested? That is, yes. The crime scene team doesn't determine what is tested for further analysis. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I have for you. Thank you. You're done. Thank you. I think it might be time for another break. That'd be fine. Yeah. yeah. Take another short break, folks. Back on the record, we've got our jury with us. It's uh, 1234. And um, We've got everyone else here that we need to have in order to resume with the trial in the Brian Smith case. We're ready to hear from the state's next witness. Judge, the state calls Lieutenant Amanda Fisher. Lieutenant, please raise your right hand and we'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony we give in the case now before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Could you please state your name and swear your last name? Amanda Fisher, F I S H E R. Lieutenant Fisher, could you introduce yourself to the jury, please? Hi there, my name is Amanda Fisher. I've been with APD for 22 and a half years now. Uh, I was a member of the crime scene team for 15 years. When you promote to Lieutenant though, they give you the boot off of the specialty team. So I had to leave the crime scene team at that time. And when did you become a Lieutenant? In January of last year. And so uh, in October of 2019, were you on uh, still a member of a, a crime scene team? I was. And, um, could you describe the various roles that you have done as a member of the crime scene team? Well, I've handled all of the different jobs that we have on the crime scene team as far as taking care of video, photography, evidence, um, diagramming, casting, all of the different technical forensic jobs that we can handle. I've also been a team leader for the crime scene team, and I did that for about the last year and a half as my job on the crime scene team. And in 2000, so in 2019, you would have just been a regular member of the crime scene versus a leader. Is that if I did the math right? Yes, we can call me regular. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to take you back to October, um, early October of 2019. Were you called out as a member of the crime scene team to help process a number of different um, locations related to this investigation? Yes, I was. I want to talk first about. Um, the uh, 
Crime scene team's response to Town Place Marriott Suites number 323. Were you part of that team that responded to that response, to that location? I was the team leader of that group. There was a small group of us, yes. Okay. And then as the team leader of that group, what was your role? Um, I just assigned the tasks to everybody. I'm the one who met with Detective Lee to gather the, the initial stack of paperwork so we knew what it is doing. Um, and then I assigned the tasks to Officer Sitz and to Detective Davies so that we all knew exactly what we needed to do when we got there. And did you, um, as you were then there at the scene, well, we just heard from Detective Davies and we saw the photos from that particular scene. Were you there when he, those photos were being taken? Actually, I believe he said you took the photos, if I recall correctly. I did a diagram. Okay. Um, I think he took the photos and the video. Okay, so my apologies. Yeah, he took the- Mile 108 is where he took the photos, sorry. That's you correct, were, okay. at mile 108, I took those photos okay. out on the railroad track. Um, <laughs> yes, he did the photos and the video. Um, I did a diagram and I collected evidence at the hotel. Okay, and um, at the particular hotel, we saw some pictures of um, Blue Star on the carpet. Can you explain to the jury what Blue Star is? It's a chemical that you mix, we mix it up, it comes in tablet form and you mix it with water and then you spray it um, in areas where you have concern that perhaps cleanup might've taken place. Um, and what happens is when it comes in contact with blood or where blood was, where there's still remaining blood that perhaps you can't even see with your naked eye, it uh, reacts with the hemoglobin in the blood and it blows or it fluoresces kind of this purplish bluish color um, and it shows where it, it can indicate where cleanup has taken place um, or perhaps where blood was in the area at a prior time, perhaps where you can't see it anymore with your naked eye. Are there other things that this that Blue Star might indicate is present other than blood? Yes. And what would those things be? Um, there are some different chemicals that it can react with. Bleach is one, um, though it reacts differently than it does with blood. How so? Um, with bleach in particular, it tends to fluoresce very, very quickly and very, very brightly, like very brightly. And with blood, it tends to be a less quick response and it's not nearly as bright as it is with bleach. It's not, um, it doesn't glow nearly as brightly. When something glows um, that, that seems to be glowing, like you say the blood might glow, what does that mean to you as a, as a member of the crime scene team? It indicates to me that that there's the uh, a striking possibility that blood may have been in that location. And then do you take additional steps based on where those things light up as to what you might do as a member of the crime scene team? Yes. And what would those be? Typically what we'll do is use uh, something called a hemostick. Okay, and what's that? A hemostick is, it's a, a little stick um, and it has a little yellow pad on the end of it. And what we do is collect a sample from the area where we believe that the, the reddish stain is that we believe might be blood. And we'll swab that from that area. Take that swab and touch it on the little yellow pad on the hemostick. And if there's a positive response that would indicate blood, the hemostick will turn green. Now, do you do that every single time? Not every single time. Why would be, what would be times when you wouldn't do a hemostick? Um, after we've done it a, a couple of times at a scene, we don't tend to do it every single time at a scene. Um, there are some times where um, we're concerned that by swabbing the sample, we might use all of the sample and don't want to do that by using it up on a hemostick. We would rather collect it for perhaps testing in the future. Okay. Are you as a member of the crime scene team, a decision maker as to what ultimately gets text tested after it's been collected by your team? No. Who makes those decisions? People like Detective Lee. Okay. So um, I wanna take you next to, so we talked uh, that you did actually take the photos at mile 108. So that is another one of the, the scenes that you responded to as a member of the crime scene team, correct? I did. Okay. And then also, did you respond as a member of the crime scene team to um, 1353 Staubach Circle? I did. Okay. And can you describe your involvement in that particular um, service of a search warrant at that location? Um, I was there for part of the time. I didn't get to stay for the entire time with the rest of the team. Um, but my role, my primary role there was to collect video evidence. So I walked around with a digital video camera and held it at about eye level. 
um, and just walked around the entire residence so that in theory, anybody else would be able to see the video as if they were me walking through the residence. Who else was um, at that residence uh, per, in assisting the crime scene team? Um, Officer C now, she was Officer Reeves at the time. Detective Davies was there, Sergeant Bakken was there. Um, and I'm not sure who else was there, to be honest with you. Do you recall if cyber crimes, uh, individuals from the cyber crimes unit were there? Yes, they did show up okay. in force. Was that unusual? Yes. Okay. Do you recall about how many people showed up from the cyber crimes team? I want to say about four. Okay. Um, you took video of the residents. Was that both inside and outside? Yes. Okay. And then do you do that before photos are taken? Um, sometimes it's in tandem while perhaps while the person doing photos is inside the house, I might be outside and vice versa, but it's one of the first things that's done because we want to make sure that we get video and photographs before any evidence is moved, anything's touched, anything's altered in any way, shape or form. We want to just document the scene as it was before we got there. And your army approach? Yes. Lieutenant Fisher, I've uh, given you a stack of exhibits. Those are exhibits 118 through 198. And do you recognize those? Yes. And what in general are those? Well, the top one is a picture of the residents on Staboff. The whole pic, all the pictures in general, are they of, in general, what are they pictures of? They are all pictures of the residents on Staboff. Okay. And, um, are those a fair and accurate representation of that residence um, at the time that you were there and what you observed? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, and those were taken not by you, correct, but by another crime scene team member? Correct. Okay. But as you said, those are taken in tandem sometimes as long, along with you doing the video, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and um, you said Officer C had also responded to the residents. We heard from Detective Davies that he actually timed out at the scene. Did that also occur to you as well? It did. Okay, and what does that mean exactly? So we have time limits for how long we can work in any 24 hour period for safety sake. And at 18 hours in a 24 hour period, we're required to be off duty uh, unless it's our Friday and then we can work 24 hours or 20 hours, I apologize. Um, but at 18 hours, I had already worked 18 hours while we were there working at the scene. So I had to stop working. So that's when we time out is at 18 hours. And so I had to stop and go home and get rest before I could go back to work again. So apparently Detective Davies had was in the same boat as I was. So we both timed out. So we had to leave. And Officer right. Filipovich was there too because he's the one who took the van back. So that's one of the other people who was there was Officer Filipovich. Okay. And you also mentioned Officer C. Did she come in later towards the end to sort of like tag team into the crime scene while you and Detective Davies were leaving? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> at this time, I'd like to move to um, admit state's exhibits 118 through 198 and publish them to the jury. No objection. They're admitted. You may publish. The assistance of our JS officer, we will get our, the TV oriented. Okay. So, looking at State's Exhibit 118, what are we looking at? The front of the residence on Staba. Okay. 119? The garage doors on Staba. 120. The front door of the residence. Sorry. 121? That is looking. At the, the front door is on the left and that's the man door into the garage and there's a closet on the right. So we're looking at this, we're standing on the split level entryway of the residence looking at the front door on the left. 122? Um, that's the inside of the garage after the garage doors are open. And, um, sorry, I'll keep going, 123? Uh, that's the vehicle parked on the right side of the garage once the garage is opened. 124. Uh, that's the license plate FSL 878 on the truck. And what kind right. of, I'm looking in that photo, what kind of truck is that? A Ford, I believe it's a Ranger. 
I think it's a Ford Ranger. And picture 125? Uh, a locking mechanism on the pull over the hopper on the truck of, that's on the right side of the garage. 126. The truck after it's been pulled out of the garage. And why was the truck being pulled out of the garage? Uh, because we had a search warrant to, ser to serve on it. So we were taking it elsewhere to serve the search warrant on it. 127? The right side of the garage after the truck was pulled out of it. 128? Uh, just another view, kind of the cabinetry on the um, right side of the garage. And then that red door is the man door into the house that we looked at from the inside a little while ago. 129. So this is standing on the entryway in the house. The front door is on the right side of you and you're looking up the split level entryway toward the upstairs of the residence. 130. This is standing at the top of the split level, um, just looking to the right at the top of the split level at the dining room area of the house. 131. Um, same thing, just a slightly different angle, um, still at the top of the, the stairs that go up and then the kitchen, there's two, there's two entrances to the kitchen and this is the first one that's on your left here to go into the kitchen. And is there a room to the left of the, as you go past the cabinet that's there on the left, is there kind of a room area to the left as well? It wraps there? around and then there's another entrance. It's kind of a U shape or a, an L shape. And then you can go into the kitchen again from the other side. Okay. And is that that room that on the L shape? This is the L shape. And then there's the other entrance to the kitchen. Okay. And that was in the left area by, it looks like a TV on the wall. Is that correct? Yes. So you just just past the piano. Okay. 133. 133 is a look back toward the stairs from the dining room area. And that open door on the right is the first entrance to the kitchen that we were looking at. And uh, back in the distance there is the, the master bedroom upstairs. 134 is the kitchen. 135, the master bedroom. 136. Uh, another view of the master bedroom, this time with the closet and the bathroom visible in it. 137. In the master bedroom, that's just to the right of the door. Uh, if you're looking at the door to go out, it's just to the right of it. 138. Is the office upstairs. 139. Desk area, it looked like it was set up for maybe perhaps multiple people, like maybe different workstations. There were separate areas of working. 140. Uh, just an, another view of the different areas of the desk. And 141. Uh, just a kind of another wraparound view to the right of the desk. 142. Mail addressed to Brian Smith from Alaska USA Federal Credit Union. 143. Uh, the, if you're standing at the desk, looking to the left, this is kind of the left view of the desk with some, um, chests visible sitting on the, the, uh, table there or the desk itself. And how many, um, chests do you see in that photo? Two. Okay. 144. The workstation on the right on the desk. And 145. Additional photograph of the workstation on the right with areas, um, further area over to the right with shelves visible. And 146. Uh, we're back at the entryway of the house. This time we're looking down the stairs to go down into the lower part of the house. 147. This is the area directly at the bottom of the stairs. So you can see the stairs on your right. And then there's a, a closet under the stairs, the, the door. This is the closet under the stairs. And then there's just a big open family room area downstairs. 148. The uh, Just a slightly different angle of the closet under the stairs in the family room. And you can see up to that split level entryway there. What was located inside this closet area? Um, many different firearms, ammunition, and then back in the back of the closet is another closed off storage area. 149? Uh, 149 is just part of the family room. 150? 
the family room. And is this, um, would you describe these pictures as sort of kind of being taken as someone would be scanning with a camera, like you would the, the video kind of left to right or right to left? Yep, the goal, the goal when you're taking photographs is to capture every inch of, of what it is that we're seeing so that we could show it to somebody else. And while we can't necessarily bring somebody else to the residents, we can try and bring the residents to them. And this is the easiest way to do it is by video and photographs. So it's it's just capturing kind of every inch over a series of overlapping pictures to bring them so that somebody else would be able to see them and see everything involved. 151. 151 is moving to the left in that family room area over toward another sitting area where there's an entertainment center. 152. That's that other sitting area. There's it's there's a, this is a red couch just kind of sitting facing the entertainment center. And then off to the left, there's a, like an open bar area. 153. It's that red couch area facing the entertainment center again. 154. That's the, the bar area to the left of that second sitting area. 155. The entertainment area downstairs. 156. Uh, a trunk in front of the red couch downstairs in front of the entertainment area. 157. Uh, just a different angled look at the bar downstairs. 158. The red couch downstairs in the sitting area by the entertainment center. 159. Uh, some views of the uh, I'll call them racks of firearms under the stairs. Does that have two pictures on that particular there's, photo? There's two pictures. Slide. So this is just a different angle of, of this one, just turned slightly inward so that you can see these better. And is this the area under the stairs you said where there were a number of firearms and ammunition located? Yes. Okay. 160? 160 is, is the top of that rack that we just looked at with lots of ammunition stacked on it. 161? is the lower portion of that rack again. 162 is an area to the right of that rack with uh, an, another set of firearms. 163. This is the, the smaller storage area that I had mentioned earlier that's farther at the back of the, the cubby under the stairs. 164. Just another view into that second little storage nook back there. Or um, what uh, in the, kind of left-hand area of uh, that storage area, are there bags of some kind? Over here? Yes. Those are um, long gun cases. Okay. 165. Um, the, the laundry area downstairs, this is basically at, at the bottom of the stairs, coming down the stairs, you walk into the laundry area right in front of you. And the area then to the right is at the kind of the bar area you could sort of see in those previous pictures. Right, that's the bar area. 166. Um, it's just a kind of a general overall area. The, the closet with the guns, the firearms was on the left. There's the laundry area. And then the stairs to go upstairs is right behind this door right here, right behind the door that's open. And that you can see two kind of doors in the middle of the picture, mm -hmm. the door on the right, what does that go to? It's a restroom. And then the door to the left that's open, what, what, what would you describe that area as? It's a, it's a bedroom. I, while I was there, referred to it as the sewing room. Um, there's a lot of sewing things in there. So that's just the way I described it um, for the sake of clarifying it from the other bedroom. So it, that's how I identified it. Okay. 167. This is the bathroom downstairs. 168. That's a view into that second bedroom or the sewing room that I had made note of. And is this looking at the left-hand side of the bedroom? This is the, when you're standing at the doorway to that second bedroom or the sewing room, this is the left-hand side of that room. 169. This is staring basically at the center of that room. 170 is looking to the right-hand side of that room. So the right-hand side was more of a bedroom and the left-hand side was more of a sewing area. 171. 
that's the bedroom area in that bedroom downstairs. 172. Um, on the far right hand side is the door to leave the room. And then it's a big bookshelf on that wall. 173. The bed in the bedroom downstairs. 174. That's Sergeant Bakken with several firearms on the carpet in front of him in cases or holsters. And do you know where those were located in the residence? Those were in the closet under the stairs. 175. A view into one of the bags that was in the closet under the stairs. And 176. That's a closer view of the firearms, the smaller mm -hmm. firearms that were found under the stairs. 177. That is one of the pistols removed from one of those black cases that was found under the stairs. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, what color is that particular pistol? It's black and it appears kind of army greenish. 178. Um, the other side of that pistol. And what are those, uh, the letters at the top? GSG. 179. Um, the serial number on that pistol that we just saw in the first picture, it's the first side of that picture that we looked at. Do you recall um, what time of day you responded to begin serving the search warrant on this residence? If memory serves, it was at about 3.45. And uh, what time did you, do you recall at what time you timed out, what time of the day? I don't off the top of my head, no. Was it uh, likely dark outside? Do you recall if it was daylight or dark? I believe it was dark out. Do you remember how many hours you were at this house? I don't. Okay. When you're on a crime scene um, and you're serving a search warrant, um, what kind of information do you get initially when you're going to serve a search warrant as to what kind of evidence you might be looking for? Um, with the search warrant, generally there's an attachment or a part of the document that tells us exactly what we are able to search for. Um, because we don't want to seize anything that wasn't permitted because that would be illegal. Um, so we are told in advance what type of uh, articles we're able to search for, whether it be firearms, ammunition. Um, in some cases, we're looking for drugs, drug paraphernalia, money, things like that. It, it depends on the case because only in certain cases can you search for certain things. In your experience um, as being a member of the crime scene or being the crime scene team lead, do you get kind of ongoing new information when you might be at a scene, processing a scene? Yes, we have, we have frequent conversations back and forth with detectives while we are there because they are talking to people while we are dealing with the scene. And then you also share information that you're finding with them uh, at the same time. So it's a uh, each of you are sharing or updates as to what's happening. We do. We have conversations back and forth with them a lot during this during the time we're there. At some point in time, did uh, the crime scene team become aware that there is additional search of the living room um, and specifically the downstairs area needed to be searched based on information provided by the detectives who are interviewing Mr. Smith? Yes. Okay. I want to move on to um, number 180. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is that a photo of? That's the red couch that's facing the entertainment center downstairs. And at this point in time, does it, it looks like the couch might be on sliders. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And why would that be? Do you think the, I mean, I guess, let me ask this. Did the crime scene team put that, the, that couch on those sliders? No. Okay. Those were already there. Those were already there. Okay. 181. Uh, just another angle of the red couch with the, the trunk in front of it. Let's look at 182. Um, the area showing the floor in front of it after the trunk has been moved. At this point in time, did the crime scene team receive information that Mr. Smith admitted to um, killing a person in his living room? Yes. Okay. Page one, number 183. Very dark. It's very dark. And uh, Mr. Clark, can you turn the light down and much? See if that'll help. I know there's a glare on the TV, but what are we looking at in this picture? Right in this area right here, you can see purple. That's the luminescence from Blue Star. That's that purple luminescence, that glowing color that happens when Blue Star reacts with 
um, what can be blood. And what does that tell you then for this particular area? That told us that we needed to look in that general area for evidence. Okay. And Master Clerk, if you can uh, bring the lights back up. Here's, well, actually, I'm not sure that helped, but the glare on the TV is pretty bad. I'm not, it's a dark picture. There, that's better. Thank you. Here's picture 184. What are we looking at in this picture? This is what a hemostick looks like. The little thing that we use to test if there's blood. And this particular picture, um, do you can you tell if there is what the reaction was from on the stick? It it might be hard for you to see because it's so far away. But on the left side of the stick, it's green, and on the right side of the stick, it's still yellow. The swab had touched the left side of it, so that's where that green reaction was, telling us that we had a presumptive positive response. And here's a better lit picture, although I don't know. If I, I don't know if we want to call that better or not, but <laughs> brighter, I guess. Yeah, it's 185. It's, it's still showing that presumptive positive response, which indicates to us that, to us, that tells us that it's blood. Okay. 186. What are we looking at in this picture? Um, so this is the the same area of the floor, except we scooted the couch back, and we've got three different areas. I don't know if you can see the circles we used a sharpie to just circle several areas that we saw um, some red um, discoloration in the greenish carpet. 187. Basically the same thing, just a slightly different angle. 188. Same thing, looking at placards two and three in the area underneath the the carpet here, there's two and three, and then we had this whole area kind of marked off here. And at this point, had the crime scene team pushed the red couch back? Into yes. The living to the air, uh, away from that area? Right. The couch had been pushed back. Here's where the original sliders had been sitting. And the front of the couch was, the underneath of the couch was sitting right here, and we scooched it back. And then uh, last picture is 189. I'm sorry, not last picture, picture 189. And we're looking at 189 is um, discoloration of the, in the red circle next to placard one. <clears throat> 190. Just a closer view of that red discoloration in placard one. 191. Um, that's where we swabbed for placard two with the red discoloration with my initials next to it. 190. My when that was 191, this is 192, 192. sorry. 192, red discoloration inside of placard three. 193. Um, same placards visible, except now we've drawn a north indicator in the carpet just to show relationship of where everything is in relationship to the earth. 194. Um, looking at it from a different angle. So looking at it from the other side, basically. 195. Same, same thing, same area, just looking at it from a different angle. Again, we're, we're trying to show everything with every inch of, of what we can see while we're standing there. We're trying to bring it so that somebody else would be able to look at it from every different angle that, that we can see it from. We're trying to bring those pictures to somebody else. 196. Same area, standing back by the edge of the couch. 197. Same thing, the floor in front of the couch. Sorry. And then 198. Uh, just the north marker on the floor in the living room in front of the couch. You uh, Were you present when um, any carpet was removed from the residence? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, and did then when someone leaves the... When you at the end of processing a crime scene, what what kind of photos are taken then? Uh, we call them exit photos. Okay. And how do those work? Um, so we take we take series of series multiple series of photos when we're there at the scene. So we take entry photos to show what it looked like before we altered the scene in any way, before we looked for evidence, before we moved anything, before we touched anything. So that's that first series of photos that Detective, Tavy, that Detective Davies took. And then as we go through the process of searching somewhere or altering the place, or in this case, removing carpet, um, then we take pictures along the way as we process that. 
And then the last thing we do before we leave is take exit photos. And that's to show a couple of things. We leave a copy of the search warrant there to show that we left the search warrant there. Um, and it's also to show the condition in which we left the environment when we were finished with the place um, so that it's documented how we left it. So that's what the exit photos look like. After we have taken the exit photos, we do no further investigation in the residence. Um, Judge, may I approach this? Yes. I've shown you a open market states exhibit 200. Do you recognize that? I do. And what is that? That is the pistol that we just saw pictures of in the exhibits we looked at just a minute ago. And how do you know that that pistol is the one that's in the photos that we saw earlier? Well, I can verify it with the serial number. Um, maybe if I can get the glare off. Hang on one second, I gotta find a picture of it. Okay. Serial number on here is the same as the serial number on the picture here. Okay. At this time, uh, and do you know, uh, Officer Fisher or Lieutenant Fisher, what kind of gun that is? No. Okay. I'm gonna be honest with you. I am not a gun person. That's fine. No. All right. At this time, uh, Judge, I would like to move to admit Exhibit 200. Is there objection? Um, I don't know if that's been made relevant to a fact of issue yet. So yes. Okay. Relevance. The relevance is the defendant on his interview admitted to killing someone in his living room with a gun that was green that is he gave the make and model and that gun was located in his house so it's extremely relevant yeah overruled the uh, exhibit is admitted Can I hear, uh, may we approach on that you may there's all the questions i have for lieutenant fisher you're done. Thank you. Thank you. We the take state down. next calls Officer C. Okay, we should uh, turn off the exhibit. Yeah. Good afternoon. Please remain standing, raise your right hand, and we'll swear you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony will give in the case now before this court to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please be seated and please state your name and spell your last name. My name is Chelsea C. It's C H E L S E Y. Last name is S E E. And Officer C, were you, could you introduce yourself to the jury, please? I can. Hi, I'm Officer C. I've worked with APD for just over eight years. Uh, I'm currently in the domestic violence unit as an investigator over at the Boney Courthouse. Uh, I've been on our crime scene team for just over four years now. And in 2000, October of 2019, were you called Officer C? Uh, no, I was called Officer Reeves, my maiden name. Okay. And um, I want to take you to, when did you start being on the crime scene team? Uh, it was in 2019. Okay. And did you um, respond to help in a couple of different, processing a couple of different search warrants involved in this particular investigation? Yes, I did. Did you respond to the 1353 Staubach Circle? I did. At what time of the day did you respond? Uh, it was late, about 11 p.m. And why uh, did you respond such at such a late time? 
I was called by uh, then our team leader, Sergeant Bakken, who said he needed relief um, on crime scene. You can only work so many hours before you're forced to stop and take a break. Uh, at that point, some of the team members were getting ready to need that break. Uh, so I was called to come in and relieve them. What were your duties as one of the relief officers for that crime scene team? Uh, I picked up taking photographs and it was mostly exit photographs. Did you also help with uh, processing any of the evidence? Uh, not particularly, no. Okay. But were you there while they were processing evidence from the scene? Yes, I was. Okay. Judge, may I approach the witness? Yes. Okay. I'm showing you what's been marked as state's exhibits um, 211 through 258. Let's start first with um, exhibits. 211 through 219. Do you recognize those? Uh, I do. In general, what are they? Uh, these are photographs that I took at the address of 1353 Starbucks Circle. Okay. And were those considered quote unquote exit photos? For the most part, yes. Okay. Um, when you arrived on scene, who else uh, for the crime scene team was there at that point in time, if you recall? Uh, I know then Sergeant Fisher was still there, um, Sergeant Bakken, um, I don't recall who else. Okay. And when you were arrived, you, what did they have you do initially? Uh, initially, they directed me to the garage to photograph an item that was in the garage um, prior to entering the residence and taking extra photographs. Oh. At this time, Judge, I would like to move to, and on exhibits 211 through 219, um, are those a fair and accurate representation of the photos that you took on that particular day at the residence? Yes, they are. Judge, at this time, I'd like to move to uh, admit exhibit, exhibits. Sorry, we have our 211 to 219 uh, and publish them for the jury. Is there objection? No objection. Okay. You're admitted. You may publish. So, Officer Steve, if we could start, let's talk first about Exhibit um, 211. What are we looking at in this photo? Uh, this is the double car garage at the residence. And you were asked to take, you said, photos of this, the garage when you arrived. Um, did uh, anyone explain to you what you needed to take photos specifically? Yes, specifically, there was an item near the divide between the two garages um, of interest. And what was that item? Um, it was described to me as possibly a homemade silencer. Okay. Let's look at uh, 212 then. What, would, what is uh, exhibit 212? Uh, 212 shows the item on the ground there, uh, close to the divide between the two garages. Okay. And exhibit 213? Uh, shows the item that was described to me. And 214? Uh, this is one side of the item. And then 215? This is the other side of the item. Okay. Judge, at this time, can I approach the witness? Yes. Okay. And Officer C, I've uh, shown you what's marked as Exhibit 263. Do you recognize that item? I do. And what is that item? Uh, it's the item from photographs. Okay. And that is... Um, That is a homemade silencer that you um, took photographs. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And judge, at this time, I'd like to move to admit exhibit 263. Object, may we approach on this one, Judge? Yes, you may. Action over. Moving on then to um, pictures you took inside the residence. Let's move on to exhibit number 216. Mm -hmm. What are we looking at here? 
Uh, this is the downstairs portion of the residence uh, in the southeast corner uh, living area. And um, I see an item that appears to be rolled up towards the left-hand side of the photo. What is that? That's the carpet of the area. Okay. And um, what is, uh, can you describe that rolled up carpet? What are we looking at there? Yeah, the rolled up carpet appeared to have a reddish brown stain soaked through to the bottom of the carpet. Looking at exhibit number 217. And what is that a picture of? Uh, it's a closer photograph of the same item. It's the rolled up carpet with the reddish brown stain. Uh, and you can also see uh, underneath that uh, another similar reddish brown stain. And is this carpet at this point something that the crime scene team has cut out and rolled up? Yes. Okay. 218. Uh, also rolled up carpet with the reddish brown stain. And then exhibit number 219. Uh, this was after the carpet was completely cut out and removed from the scene. And is this uh, what you would call an exit photo then of the room after you all had left it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You, the carpet was seized as part of the crime scene team's investigation, correct? Yes. Okay. When, the car when items are seized as evidence, um, are they given a specific identity or tag number? Yes, ma'am, they are. And why is that? Uh, to keep evidence in order, uh, make sure there's a chain of custody. Okay. Do you uh, know or can you refresh from your um, reports the tag number that the carpet was given? Don't believe I have that report. Um, I believe it was Sergeant Fisher at the time who had the carpet. Okay. Or was the evidence custodian? Give me one second. Yes, yes, it is. And Judge, may I approach? Yes. <laughs> yes, yep. Okay, hang on one second. Got it, it's right one. There, um, when you're involved in a crime scene team, as, uh, there's lots of different roles, correct? Yes, ma'am. And do you all assist each other as you're collecting evidence? I'm sorry, can you repeat? Sure. Do you all assist each other as you're collecting evidence and tagging it? Typically, yes. Okay. I want to show you but what's been marked as exhibits uh, 262, 61, and 262. <laughs> Do you recognize uh, that those exhibit or those uh, exhibits? Yes. Yes, I do. And what are those? These are pieces of carpet that were cut from the downstairs area. And how do you know, um, you did some looking at things. What were you looking at? Uh, the tags and the item descriptions. Okay. And um, how do you know that those then correspond with the carpet that you were, you took pictures of earlier? Uh, typically they're diagrammed out. I can see marks made here for areas of interest. Um, and so there would be something corresponding to tell us where that came from. Okay. And so you are, do you recognize then that those are the carpets from those photos we talked we saw earlier? These are the same. This is the same carpet. Yeah. At this time, Judge, I'd move to admit 260, 261, and 262. No objection. Admitted. Did you also help in uh, processing uh, a search warrant that was executed on a black Ford truck? Yes, I did. And who were the other officers involved in that search warrant? Uh, Detective Straley and Detective Aldridge. What was your role in the, that particular uh, execution of that search warrant? 
Um, I assisted with evidence collection and fingerprinting of the vehicle. And uh, did the detective Straley take photos? Yes, he did. Were you there when he was taking those photos? I was. I'm going to show you actually in front of you is exhibit marked um, 220 to 258. And do you recognize those? Yes, I do. And what in general are those? These are overall photographs of the truck. Okay. And are those a fair and accurate representation of uh, the truck on the day that you and the other officers executed the search warrant on the truck? Yes. At this time, Judge, I would move to admit and publish exhibits 220 to 258. Any objection? No objection, Judge. Admitted, you may publish. Okay, we're looking at exhibit 220. What is that? Uh, these are overall photographs of the exterior of the truck. Where is this truck located at the time that these photos are being taken? This is an indoor secure uh, garage at the Elmore station uh, for APD at the time. Okay. Exhibit 221. Uh, the rear of the truck. Exhibit 222. Uh, the driver's side seat. 223, uh, the passenger seat, front passenger seat. 224, this is two photos in, on one side. Uh, it's on the passenger seat. It looks to be a um, hook for hanging clothing. Okay. Um, on 224, what is that? 224 is the clothing hook. So it's, what are the, what does it actually say it is besides the clothing hook? Oh, sorry, 225. 225. Sorry. That's okay. Um, it's a clothes hook camera uh, and has um, characters of the product, operation guide, uh, and appears similar to the one on the seat other than the color. 226. Uh, this is a USB uh, in the center console. Uh, what do you mean by a USB? Is that a, a is that a digital storage device? Possibly a flash drive is what it appears to be to me. Twenty seven. Uh, these are the items on the passenger seat. And can you describe in general what we're looking at? It looks like in those pictures. Yeah, it looks like a charging cable for a phone, some keys, paperwork, uh, and possibly latex or nitrile gloves. 228. 228, uh, temporary driver's license for Brian Stephen Smith. 229. Uh, more photographs of the center console and the contents there. I can see um, the previous photograph, Nature Valley bar, some keys, uh, pen, possibly a room key or room tag. 230. Uh, this is the glove box. Again, uh, looks like an Xbox game, Sharpie, and more of the nitrile or latex gloves. 223. 31. I'm sorry. Jeez. That's okay. I'm 231. I have glasses on. I still can't read. Okay. Um, looks like some cards for the Spring Hill Suites and also. Uh, what appears to be the center console and contents in there. Um, I can see some mouthwash um, and various items. 232. 232. I can't be certain. Um, possibly a key fob. And is that uh, two pictures, one of the top and one of the side of it, that particular? Yes, it is. Item? And does that item, it looks like on the, is the, the bottom right-hand corner picture, does that look like it has some kind of ability to plug into it? It does. 233. Uh, this is from the center console. I can see some condiments and some live cartridges for ammunition, some change, an SD card. 234. Um, this is live cartridges and um, a buckshot round, and then also a shell casing. It appears to be on the floorboard. I'm not sure which one, though. 235. Um, 
in the right hand photograph, it's a black zip tie. And on the left upper hand, uh, an SD or a micro SD card. 236. Uh, this is a GoPro mount. 237. Uh, this is a tube that we found in the truck. Um, again, similarly described to me by Detective Straley as possibly a tube from the truck. Direction of hearsay. A tube from the truck isn't hearsay. But, uh, I, under, I, I sustain the objection right. as to the opinion of, or the assertion on what it was. Okay. 238. Uh, this is the rear area of the truck. I can see some mouthwash, towels, earphones, uh, and you can see the partial partial of that tube that was previously mentioned. 239. Uh, just a different angle of also the back area with the towels. Um, I can see paperwork for a track phone. Um, again, the earphones, some tape. 240. This is a receipt from the Arctic Turn Inn. What is the date on that receipt? It is uh, September 2nd, 2019 at 1047. Exhibit 241. Uh, two receipts. The one on the right hand side is for Walmart on A Street. It's dated for September 3rd, 2019 at 925 p.m. Uh, and the one on the left is also from Walmart on A Street uh, with the same date of September 3rd, 2019 at 9.18 p.m. 2.42. I see, I'll start with the right-hand side. So there's a track phone smartphone card. Uh, down in the center, there's again, the paperwork for the track phone. And on the left-hand side, there's a quick start guide. Um, and I'm not clear if it's the track phone or not, but a quick start guide. Is a, what is the model in the upper right hand corner for the user guide? Uh, TCL A1 and uh, there's A50, I'm sorry, A501 DL. Exhibit 243. Um, a receipt for Home Depot on uh, Tudor and it's dated for September 5th, 2019 at 9.32 PM. And can you see what the receipt is for? I can, it looks like a locking hasp key lock, three and a half inch black and cleanup 32 Clorox commercial cleanup 32 ounces. Exhibit 244. Um, this is a McDonald's receipt from 800 West Northern Lights. It's dated for September 6th, 2019 at 159 AM. 245. Um, this is the rear of the truck. Does that include the tailgate of the truck? Yes, it does. 246. Uh, this is the bed of the truck. And is that the right hand side or the left hand side in this photo? As you're standing at the back of the truck, looking towards the cat, towards the front of the truck. Towards the front of the truck. I'm sorry. Yes. Then it's the left or the right hand side. I'm sorry. Um, I can't tell. I believe it's from inside the truck, but I, I can't tell for sure. Okay. 247. Uh, also the bed of the truck. There is a, what is that object in the middle, or I guess to the left, uh, sort of in front of the wood looking area? There's a black and blue bag. Okay, get an overnight bag. 248. 248. And Master Clerk, can you dim the lights a little bit? One, uh, let's try. Okay. Uh, 248 was on the bed of the truck, um, particularly of interest, some reddish brown stains near the metal siding. Can you, on the screen behind you, point out to the jury what you're talking about? So kind of in the middle of the picture and then a little bit towards uh, the top yeah. on the, I guess, to the right of the, the metal strip. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. 249. 
these are also uh, stains of interest, reddish brown on the bed of the truck near the siding. 250, what are we looking at here? Uh, so these stains were tested with hemostics, which is a presumptive positive for blood. And uh, they were each labeled based on the stain. So T1, T2, uh, et cetera. Uh, and the stain, or I'm sorry, the hemostics next to them showing uh, from the three that I can see a presumptive positive for blood. 251. Uh, this is also the bed of the truck. I can see um, a spray bottle of Clorox bleach. 252. 252, also the bed of the truck. Um, an Adidas black bag, um, looks like some duct tape, um, a trash bag, uh, the contents of the bag. Okay, 253. Um, again, the bed of the truck, um, that same black and blue bag mentioned previously um, and various other items. 254. Uh, the same blue and black bag from the bed of the truck. 255. Um, some of the contents of um, not the main pocket, but the front pocket and one of the side pockets of that blue and black bag. 256. 256. The from the same blue and black bag looks like a night or latex blue glove. 257. Uh, this is the main portion of the blue and black bag. Um, looks like plastic cups, paper cups, some towels, um, clothing. 258. Um, also the contents of the main portion of the blue and black bag uh, with some of the top items removed. Um, I can still see a towel, paper cups, um, possibly an extension cable and some white rope. And then did you, you said you helped uh, Detective Aldridge and Detective Straley with the collection of items from the truck? Yes, I did. Yeah, uh, we're getting pretty late in the day. I think I, I actually think I'm done with my direct judge. I just, let me double check one thing. That is all I have for my direct judge. Thank you. Will there be a cross examination? And you're done. Thank you. Folks, that's it for the day and for the week. And we'll see you on Tuesday at 8 30 a.m. Have a good weekend. Please remember my admonitions about not talking with others about the case and you've seen everything you need to see before you start making up your minds. There is the courtroom, the door is closed. Is there anything we need to take up before we break for today, Council? No, Judge. No, thank you. Okay, let's break.